uh, in a couple of months, I assure you we have been in workshop session and working diligently on uh, miscellaneous items on our, on our agenda, uh, our agenda for the entire year. Uh, first item on this evening's agenda is a review of the minutes of the previous meeting, which is uh, dated January 17, 1995. Any corrections or comments from the board? Mr. Emery, uh, at the bottom of the first page, it notes that you closed the public hearing, and I thought perhaps you wanted to make an entry at the, uh, the first sentence on the last paragraph, Mr. Emery, open the public hearing, then there were no members of the public present. I recall that's Good the way point. you did it. Any other comments or corrections? <laughs> uh, on the last page, five, uh, halogen light, I think, on the one, two, three, four, five, sixth line down, the fleet has put a halogen light. I think that's one L instead of two. <laughs> right second, paragraph, second paragraph, second line. Second sentence. And one, two, three, four, five, six. This one should be stricken. Sixth paragraph, second line. Any other? <laughs> I have a motion? M move to uh, accept them as uh, modified. Second. Second. All those, raise uh, your right hand. Minutes are accepted as amended. We have many items of correspondence on uh, this evening's uh, agenda. Uh, rather than read them in any detail, I'll simply go down the list. There are so many. Uh, we have uh, a letter from the planning board uh, to the town manager regarding the planning board uh, budget recommendations for the uh, coming year. Uh, we've forwarded our planning board goals and recommendations. Uh, we have an environment and development newsletter of January 1995, uh, February 1995, and uh, March of 1995. I want to continue to thank the uh, planner for providing that information uh, for us. I think it really helps uh, the board's uh, review of projects as well as general and specific knowledge. In addition, we have a Banking of Wetlands article, the Planning Commission Journal uh, for the spring of 1995. We have the Maine Coastal Nesting Islands Forum. We have a letter from, excuse me if I mispronounce this, A. Van Lockhusen, uh, dated March, uh, sorry, May 1st, 1995. Uh, we have a Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendations uh, regarding the uh, rest facility. Uh, we have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton regarding Spurwin, Spurwink Woods. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Enman regarding Spurwink Woods. Uh, we have an article about the green markets and a letter from uh, Town Attorney Tom Leahy regarding uh, Fort Williams Review. Additionally, we've received uh, at the table this evening a letter to the Town Council, a copy of a letter from the Town Council from Charles McCarthy of 12 Stony Brook Road and a memo to the Planning Board uh, from Thomas uh, Herminski and Lisa Cotter. Uh, from Delano Park. Uh, before we move on to new business, I know that uh, I is one planning board member, and I believe there are others, uh, particularly since one member uh, gave my name to a caller, and I'll allow that member to remain anonymous. Uh, I have received uh, uh, a phone call from the cutter of a project that uh, was reviewed in workshop but has not, uh, does not have standing before the board. Uh, there were several questions raised in that phone call, most of which I referred to both the code enforcement officer, since it regarded uh, land use issues, uh, which the, this board does not review, as well as other uh, procedural issues uh, that the board does review, but which is, uh, uh, can be easily found by uh, discussing with the town planner. Uh, that caller has made several calls to other planning board members, as well as to town staff and perhaps council. Uh, I would just encourage anyone who is uh, trying to discuss anything in any detail with planning board members to remember that the planning board 
uh, is not able, or is not permitted to have ex parte communication uh, with any project. Uh, we do uh, accommodate people who have questions about procedure and refer them to the appropriate town staff or departments. Furthermore, it would be extremely helpful if people are calling uh, a planning board member in the evening at home uh, near or around dinner time to please do so in a civilized uh, manner. Uh, we're all residents of the town, the planning board are all volunteer members, and it's not really appreciated to get a call at 8.30 at night and be treated uh, as an adversary uh, in very rude fashion. And uh, I wouldn't speak to my family like that. I don't expect to, to have neighbors and, and fellow citizens Cape Elizabeth treating uh, volunteer board members like that. I assume that the other board members receive the same treatment I did. Uh, we do have a thick skin, but there's really no need for such uh, conduct as far as I'm concerned. And that was the reason that this particular caller was cut short and again referred to uh, Marino Mira. Uh, enough said on that issue. First item, again, welcome everyone. Uh, first item on the evening's agenda is the Linnell wet Wetlands Alteration Permit Extension, a request by William Linnell for a one year extension of the Wetlands Alteration Permit issued by the Planning Board on June 21st, 1994. I'll ask Maureen to give us a little background and then ask the applicant to uh, make a, a brief presentation if necessary. Uh, in June of 1994, uh, William Linnell and Joyce Scofia came to the Planning Board for a wetlands alteration permit and a public access waiver. Uh, that was granted by the Board. Uh, a few months later, they came back to the Board for an amendment to their public access waiver approval. Uh, that was granted. and. Uh, now they've come back again because the, the a wetlands permit has a life expectancy of one year and uh, the applicant doesn't expect to be able to start the project before the one year time period is up and therefore he's come to the board and asked for a one year extension. Uh, there hasn't been any changes to the ordinance um, in the past year and therefore if the applicant were to go through the entire process again, it's, it's likely that the, the same result would be made by the board. So um, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Mr. Linnell, would you just care to bring us up to date as to what the situation is and what your expectations are uh, with this extension? Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, this is just plain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, if, uh, if I had the money, the road would already be built, but uh, we just need more time. And uh, I just ask for uh, it'd be a lot, uh, lot easier to just extend it than to go through uh, the whole procedure again. And so we are, we are within the, as I understand it, we're within the, we're still within that year period. So therefore, it's uh, much easier to, uh, or to ask for. Uh, this extension. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Sir? Any questions of the board? Uh, for the record, Mr. Linnell is everyone I assume knows a town councilor, and I don't know if you <laughs> served on the appointments committee, uh, but we won't. Uh, we all have children going to the school, and we discuss the school, so there's no need to uh, have any conflict of interest disclosures on this matter, as far as I know. Uh, uh, does anybody, uh, Mr. Edsel? Make a motion. Certainly, go ahead. Then. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, William Linnell is requesting a one-year extension of the <laughs> wetlands alteration permit granted by the Planning Board on June 1, 1994, for lot R221 off Ocean House Road. Number two, the Planning Board has determined the original approval supported by plans, materials, and facts presented at two meetings substantially complied with the standards of wetlands alteration permit. Number three, no substantial changes have occurred to the property or to applicable town ordinances in the last year that would substantially alter the findings made by the planning board on June 1, 19, I'm sorry, June 21, 1994. Number four, the extension request is consistent with the intent of section 19.3.9 wetlands and floodplain regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the previous plans, materials and facts submitted the request of William Linnell for extension of a wetlands alteration permit for lot R2-21 located off Ocean House Road to June 21, 1996, be granted. Second. Have a, any comment? All those in favor indicate by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Linnell. Next items on this evening's agenda 
the next two items, the Fort Williams multipurpose field and the Fort Williams uh, rest facility, I will have to recuse myself uh, with the first item, the Fort Williams multipurpose field. Um, as an employee of Terry and Architects, I was directly involved with the development of the master plan and have served uh, in some capacity on the field's uh, committee. As I explained to that committee back in November of 94, I did so with the understanding that the Planning Board did not <coughs> review applications regarding any work within Fort Williams, but instead those projects go directly to the Town Council. Um, had I known at the time that uh, that wasn't as uh, clean-cut a situation as, as I had always assumed it was, uh, I probably would not have uh, uh, been involved, but I would still have to excuse myself because of our work uh, on the master plan. Uh, similarly, with Fort Williams uh, rest, uh, rest Station, although that specific project is not part of the master plan, Terry and Architects does have an ongoing multi-year uh, planning contract with uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth, uh, and I therefore will excuse myself. Uh, another member of Terry and Architects will be here to make that presentation, and I will ask that uh, Mr. Parker, as vice chair of the board, uh, step in while I'm sitting in the back of the room. Steve. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Maureen, could you give us an introduction to this? Sure. Um, the Fields for Capes Kids for Committee has uh, proposed to build a multi-purpose athletic field in Fort Williams, and the master plan is, is over there on the easel, and I can go over in just a minute and show you where it appears in the master plan, which was adopted by the council in 1990. Um, but this particular proposal was brought by the, the Fields for Cape Kids Committee. Uh, it went to the council. The council has forwarded it to the planning board for your, your advice and your recommendation. And they have asked that you, you present that recommendation to them by the end of this month. Uh, so what you have before you is, is a presentation by uh, Pat Carroll, who will show basically what the Fields can, has in mind for a ball field. Um, you'll then be able to uh, ask questions of Mr. Carroll, uh, and then finally uh, to be looking at the field in terms of uh, what your general expertise is as planning board members, in particular looking at issues that the uh, council identified, such as uh, buffering, <coughs> lighting, noise impact, traffic patterns, and park, uh, and making a recommendation on the appropriateness of, of this particular use in Fort Williams with any other land use type comments you would like to forward to the council. Uh, just let me show you where that field is on the plane. Uh, for those of you who have a copy of the master plan, you can look at it in some detail, but this is a, a render drawing of what the master plan looks like, and the, the multipurpose field is shown in this area right here. Uh, this is Shore Road. This is the Del Park neighborhood. Um, probably most of you are familiar, this is the Portland headlight. And if you were to come down through the access road off of Shore Road, you come uh, past the beach, up the hill, down the hill. The new parking lot is here. You go past the new parking lot, and then there's a road here. And at the end of that road is where the multi-purpose field location would be. Thank you. Uh, we have a letter from the town attorney, um, Tom Leahy, that has uh, outlined um, how we are to review this particular um, item. You know, I was wondering if Mr. Leahy would just uh, come to the podium and very briefly um, give everyone an idea of what was in the letter so everyone understands. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chairman Parkhurst. Um, my name is Tom Lee. I'm at I thank all of you before and some of you at the uh, workshop that was held on this matter. Um, I really don't need to repeat what uh, was just provided to you by the town planner. Uh, one of the issues that was raised at the workshop was uh, the basis of your recommendation uh, to the town council. 
uh, there's some confusion of whether you have to go into the standards that exist in the zoning <coughs> ordinance uh, 1927 for Fort Williams Park. Uh, and I've given you my advice that those standards are for the town council to review the proposal by, but the recommendation sought by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and this planning board uh, are different, uh, that they appear to be different. Uh, they're not uh, articulated or expressed as to what the basis will be. But it's my uh, opinion and advice that the planning board uh, is looked to by the council in this ordinance provision to give them the benefit of the expertise and knowledge in land use items. Uh, keep in mind that that provision of the zoning ordinance, 1927, is applicable whether or not there will be a formal site plan review with public hearing by this planning board. So it's applicable to a number of situations, and, and in some instances the council would not have the benefit of your complete site plan review, and hence uh, I, I suggest that a fair interpretation of the recommendation is that you would look at those things that you usually look at in site plan review. I suggest that the planning board could make a recommendation with whatever uh, it can be a favorable recommendation. It can be a favorable recommendation with conditions or with suggestions. Um, and it can be subject to a final site plan review, uh, which it appears uh, to me, and I've indicated in my letter, that given the uh, size of the uh, <clears throat> area to be altered and uh, revegetated, uh, that site plan review, formal site plan review, would be required. The sequence, it seems to me, would be uh, the preliminary recommendation, which is tonight, uh, if you can complete it tonight, uh, the council uh, having their public hearing and action, and if it's a favorable action, uh, then um, a final site plan review uh, by this uh, planning board. Um, I understand that perhaps as initially submitted by the council, uh, they too, like your chairman, may not have gone through all of this to uh, <clears throat> determine in advance the procedure, but that's the way I see it at this point. Um, I'm here tonight to advise you, to answer any questions that may come up. Um, for those present, I w should say that I've advised the planning board this is not a public hearing. Um, they, the planning board, has indicated at the workshop, properly so, that the public comment would be received uh, in a controlled manner since it's not a, a, a public hearing. I think they would welcome the input uh, on those issues that they will address in their recommendation. Um, and I think we're also guided by the uh, specific request of the council in the transmission letter from uh, Mr. McGovern that did highlight a few areas that are of particular concern to the council. I think, so, and, and not coincidentally, those are site plan type issues, buffering, lighting, parking, and the like. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm here again uh, now or later to uh, answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, if I could ask a question of uh, Attorney Leahy. On page two of your, your letter, um, third paragraph, this planning board meeting will not be a public hearing and no notice will be given of this meeting as a public hearing. Um, and then we go on, in the body of the letter talks about um, public comment. And uh, over the last seven years of uh, being on this board, I've never, um, I, I can't recollect the, the board ever taking public comment without it being a public hearing. Can you shed some light on, number one, how public comment should be handled by the board? Um, I, I guess we've always been warned about the, the, the issues involving uh, unpublicized public hearings and public, it's never been called public comment before, but um, just ba basically how we can handle that. What we, and if there can be some parameters or guidelines that we, uh, by which we, I mean, earlier or later in the, the, uh, the letter, you, I guess it's later in the letter, um, you indicate that the, the, the 1927C1 through 5 need not and should not be the items by which we review this. Um, are we to listen to public comment regarding those issues? Um, Mr. Resvalli, I think it's a good question, and I think what we have here is a, uh, 
situation we find ourselves in, that this is not a public hearing uh, on the Fort Williams issues. Um, there is a time and place for that, and it's before the council. I want to make that clear. That's what the ordinance says, and that's what you should follow. Um, whereas at the workshop, there were interested parties, residents of Cape, who wanted to have the opportunity to make some comment uh, as to presumably the impact of this on their neighborhood or their properties, uh, there, were, there was an apparent feeling of the board at workshop that it was not the time that night without a secretary, without planning to do so, but that they would allow such people to make limited public comment at a later date, preferably by written submission. I think it's in the discretion of the chair to allow it, to allow a limited amount. Um, I think it's also in the discretion of the chair not to allow it if it gets into other areas than you're looking at. For example, some of the criteria for the council include uh, uh, the uh, devaluation of property and, and uh, other issues that I think are listed in the form of findings that they will have to make. Those are not for you to find. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's the boundaries aren't clear. It's up to the, you and the chair. Uh, you have a certain amount of time allotted to this. Whatever is helpful for you by public comment, I think you take and then go on. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Is the applicant uh, like to make a presentation? Thank you. My name is Joe Graff, and Dan Fisher can't be here tonight, and he asked me to uh, briefly speak in his stead. As you're well aware, the applicant is a very loose group of individuals in town that is deeply concerned that our children simply do not have the uh, necessary athletic fields available that some of our older children did have. Most of the people that are involved in this are not doing it for really at this point in time their own children. Most of our children uh, will be gone. So it, it's really on our part, uh, the goal is to do something for the town. The group initially looked at uh, the master plan and uh, you understand that the master plan has a field in this location. Pat Carroll is a landscape, landscape architect headed the effort to try to develop a proposal that's uh, a field where a field could be built, turned over to the town, and the town would control. We would like to have a constructive dialogue concerning some very important issues that the town council has referred to you, and that includes buffering, lighting, noise impact, traffic patterns, and parking. Uh, it is our goal to have a better park. It is our goal to be good citizens of Cape Elizabeth and to be considerate of all other citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And in that positive vein, uh, Pat's here tonight uh, with the site plan. Uh, he's ready to answer your questions, and we hope to provide assistance to you in grappling with uh, these issues. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Pat Carroll, and uh, as Joe said, I'm, I'm a landscape architect in town. I've also uh, volunteered to, to work with this committee on developing what I think is a, is a sensitive plan for uh, the creation of some multipurpose fields at Fort Williams. Uh, the plan you see before you, I, I think, really should be considered a preliminary plan. It's, it's really one that is evolving. I think it will continue to evolve um, as we move through the process here and uh, as we create this dialogue between the Planning Board and the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission and the Delano Park neighborhood and uh, any other interested citizens in town. Um, the, the plan that you see here has actually been revised in the last week. And that's really based on some, uh, some key input from uh, 
from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. But just to back up a little bit and give a little brief description of the project itself, um, when we first took a look at, at the identified area in Fort Williams for a multi-purpose field, uh, we went out and it was late late fall, I believe it was in November or December, and uh, we really began to kind of walk the site and really begin to analyze really what was happening out there, what, what the site conditions were really like, and uh, how we could best create a field here that was really appropriate for this, for this site. Uh, the original master plan, if you look in your, in your books, really had this ball field located over here. And uh, we went through a series of oh, three or four different alternatives, looking at uh, different locations for the ball field, locations for the uh, soccer field, and really fell back onto this scheme here uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, locating the ball field down in this corner of the park. Now, this, this plan here is actually flipped around from where the from the master plan. Uh, Delano Park is over on this side here. Uh, the lighthouse is down over here about a thousand feet or so. Uh, the road in, as Maureen said, comes in like this. This is the new parking lot that was created a couple of years ago. Uh, but this ball field here was located in the in what we call the northeast quadrant of the uh, National Guard tenting site. Um, it's in an area that is that is primarily overgrown and, and scrub growth. Uh, there's a lot of sumac and so forth. But it was located here primarily for two reasons. One is that it pushes that use as far as possible away from the Delano Park neighborhood. The second is that it puts it within a very close proximity to this existing parking lot. So we felt like like those were two very, very important reasons for locating it. The third really has to do with sun angle and orientation. And ideally, um, as indicated in the master plan, the best from a solar point of view, the best orientation was really up here. Uh, this orientation here is very similar to Playstead Park. And uh, we, we analyzed you know, the, the use of play at Playstead Park and sun angles did not really seem to be an issue. So we feel pretty good that, that this orientation really works from a solar point of view. It works from an access point of view. We're about uh, probably less than 100 feet away from the parking area. And we're about from home plate to the Delano Park property line for the fence um, of the fort is about 460 feet. The soccer field will then be run, lay in here uh, from the outside of the skinned in field, approximately 225 feet up, and it will run parallel with Blake Road here. Blake Road, right now, there's a gate at this point. That gate will remain. <coughs> This will remain pedestrian only. Uh, no vehicles will, will enter into the, into the park from that point on as it currently exists. Uh, the soccer field will be 225 feet wide, like I said, by 330 feet long. And we've really, in the last week since we walked this in a, in a site walk with the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, we've taken another look and we've actually slid this over about 25 feet from the plan that, that was submitted to you guys. And we've done that for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, by sliding it over, we can, we can bring our fence line over, and there's, a, there's an existing foundation wall here. We can run that fence line along there, which from a, from a safety and secure liability point of view really secures that area for kids. Uh, the second is that it allows us then to increase the size of the buffer area that we've, that we've got between the play field area, primarily the soccer field, in the Delano Park neighborhood. Um, right now, the way this is laid out in here, from this the southwest corner of the soccer field to the property line is about 150 feet. So we're looking at, at a minimum of 150 to approximately 460 feet from the Delano Park neighborhood is where the field would be located. Uh, with this area in here is an existing um, old building foundation. Bob Malley and Public Works use that to store materials. They store uh, wood chips and uh, infield mix and sand and so forth. It, it provides a relatively flat area. There's a concrete slab on the, on the ground so it stays dry. And uh, initially, um, we, we looked at, at buffering this whole area and talking with Bob, he would like to provide a couple of points of access into there to continue to use this area. So 
the intent would be Public Works would is is using this area now would continue to use this area for material storage, uh, but we would provide some some buffering uh, between this pedestrian walkway that runs down through here and and the uh, foundation area itself. On the uphill side of the foundation area, there's there's a fair amount of existing mature vegetation. Primarily, uh, there's some large birch clumps in here and sumac and so forth. All that would remain as much as possible, uh, and the intent would be anywhere in this in this uh, buffer area to supplement that with uh, with some evergreen material to provide um, an increased buffer zone. So we feel like we've got approximately 120 feet of buffer area here, and uh, and I think that we've made great strides in trying to to minimize the impact on the Delano Park neighborhood. Uh, parking, we, we uh, have determined that about 25 to 30 spaces will be needed for, uh, for parents and so forth during ball games and practices. Uh, and I checked that again tonight. There was actually at the far end of here, if you extend up towards Shore Road, there is a double-A field up there. I stopped by there tonight. Uh, and uh, there were actually 32 cars parked there for a game. So I think we're in, we're in the neighborhood with 25 to 30 to 35 spaces. Uh, and that, that really is uh, about what, we, what we'd need. This parking lot here was constructed a couple of years ago, and it accommodates about 85 spaces. Now, tonight when I drove up in here for the AA field, there were no, no, par no cars parked in this parking lot at all. On Sunday, which was a beautiful day, and uh, you get a lot of public use, there were about 15 cars parked in there. So we think, um, given the, the time of use of uh, the baseball season and, again, the soccer season in the fall, that we really don't see a conflict of uh, utilizing this parking area. If, if this parking area were full, there is additional parking um, in this area here, and also further up there's, there's a, a, an area that accommodates about 40 spaces right now and is identified as parking on the master plan. <coughs> um, as far as structures go, we intend to uh, construct some fencing around the outside of this, primarily to keep uh, foul balls and kids from kind of uh, going out of bounds. Um, there will be a fenced-in area to primarily to contain the kids uh, when they're not at bat or playing on the field. No dugouts are intended. Um, there would be a back site, but uh, the infield is laid out, the fence line and so forth all there. And there are flanks in the trees that indicate a fall height of the backstop, which would be the 12 feet. We don't intend to build a backstop similar to a place to park. Um, again, the, the, the intended use here, although the town is really going to be the one that's going to control ultimately who uses it. Um, the intended use would be the, the lower end of the uh, little league kids as far as, as far as that goes. It would be like eight to ten year olds, double A, triple A. Uh, as far as majors go, they, they have a field to play on and uh, um, that's, that's where they, we intend that that, was, that will remain. Um, we're not intending to provide power to the site. There will be no uh, uh, concession booth or PA system or lights, anything of that regard. We feel like for the, for the level of use that we're proposing and where the need is, that, that that's really not necessary. Uh, we would like to bring some water in. There's a water line that comes down Humphreys Road here. We'd like to bring that in in order to, to water the field. Um, I guess if you want to get into some of the technical aspects of this, the, the field right now, if you walk out there, is about 10 feet of grade change across here. And what we intend to do is, is actually cut the upper end of the field and raise the bottom end and basically flatten this off at about a 1.5% grade. So we, we're basically just taking the plane that's there and, and cutting it in at the top and filling at the bottom. Up at the top, there'd be about a three-foot cut. At the bottom, it'd be about a four-foot fill down in here. Um, and uh, we would provide 
some drainage, a drainage swale, grass line swale around the uphill side uh, that would all be uh, designed to accommodate the flows of, of stormwater and uh, any kind of erosion control measures that uh, typically would be put into place for something like that. Uh, the field would be loamed with about six inches of loam. I know Bob Malley would uh, like to see about a foot out there, but uh, you know, every six inches we, we put on there is about $30,000 worth of loam. So um, you know, we're trying to keep this as, as uh, economical as possible. And the field would be seeded then. Uh, Ideally, if, if in fact this moved forward and we built this this fall, we don't intend that play would occur probably till the fall of 96 uh, in order to give it time to, to be established. So I think that, that briefly kind of summarizes the project. I, if anybody has any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Any the members of the board like to have any questions of the applicant now? Mr. Edsel? Do you want to ask questions now? I'll wait for, for public comment. Just a question that I have. Um, I don't think you mentioned um, a spectator area uh, on here, both for, for baseball, softball, and for the soccer area. I don't know if you've walked out here, but this area back in here is, is very relatively flat for about uh, 50 to 60 feet before it begins to drop off. The intent would be that this area back <coughs> here is where spectators would probably occur. Um, as far as soccer goes, uh, you know, we're willing to, to look at a couple of options. Initially, uh, the thought was because we're cutting in here and we've got a nice bank along here that that's probably an appropriate place for spectators to, to sit and watch for soccer. Um, I was thinking about this today and perhaps maybe this area would be better suited for spectators only because it, it removes them a little bit further from the Delano Park neighborhood. Um, again, that's, that's something that uh, we'd be willing to, to work with. As far as utilities to the site, you said no electricity was planned. Uh, water? Water. Water. There, there is a water line. I believe it's a six or eight inch line that comes down Humphreys Road. We would take off of there and run just a field hydrant over, uh, primarily just to just to water the field in the summertime to keep it from burning out. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> At this time, we're going to um, open the meeting for public comment. And if I could just ask that people be uh, not long-winded, <laughs> come up to the podium and uh, give their name and, and address. And the following speakers, please don't repeat what someone prior to you has said, or if you do, just touch on it briefly. And with that, um, does anyone from the public wishes to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, Mr. Acting Chairman and members of the board. My name is Chris Vaniotis. Uh, I'm an attorney representing Bud and Marion Guthrie, who live at 8 Delano Park. Uh, I'll try to be brief. That's sort of an oxymoron to suggest an attorney will be, but I'll do my best, because I really want to make a few introductory comments, and then Mrs. Guthrie is here as well, and Mrs. Guthrie is the person who really has the, the matters of, I think, real substance to talk to you about tonight. The Guthrie's home abuts Fort Williams Park directly. Uh, Mrs. Guthrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking right about up in here, up at the upper right-hand corner as you look at the proposed site plan. Their property directly abuts the playing field site. The front porch and the front door of their home is only about 30 yards from the edge of the Fort Williams boundary. And this, this new plan obviously shows a slightly larger buffer area than was on the plan that was available a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but still, they're not going to be very far from the activity that will go on, especially on the soccer field. The, uh, the, the Little League field clearly is substantially further away from their property, from their home. But the soccer field still gets uh, very close, still within 40 yards of their property line, according to Mr. Carroll's presentation. 
We know you have a letter from your town attorney saying don't apply Section 1927 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, and I certainly am not going to persuade you to do anything different than your attorney advises tonight. Uh, I'll probably talk and write to Mr. Leahy between now and the town council meeting, and we'll also talk to the town council about that. Needless to say, we don't agree with that interpretation of the ordinance. Uh, to us, however, it's incomprehensible that even if the planning board doesn't apply those particular standards in the Fort Williams zone section of the ordinance, that there's any way you can consider this project without considering its impact on the abutting properties. And impact, of course, means impact both on the character of the neighborhood, the attributes of the neighborhood, and the values of the neighboring properties. Even without looking at Section 19-2-7 and looking only at those factors which the Town Council has asked you to consider, buffering, location of the improvements themselves, noise, and we consider hours of operation kind of a subset of noise and the length of operation during the year, traffic and parking and drainage, all those issues really require you to make an evaluation of how those factors are going to affect the budding properties, the properties of people like, like the Guthrie's. And whenever the Planning Board looks at a proposal, we recognize this is kind of an informal preliminary site plan, but whenever you look at a site plan and you look at those impacts, uh, one of the things you would do if the site plan didn't meet the standards that the site plan review ordinance requires it to meet, and those standards, by the way, include in several parts of the site plan review sections a directive that you look at the impact on abutting properties, uh, what you would do is say to the applicant, make some changes to see that it does adequately uh, eliminate adverse impacts or minimize adverse impacts to abutting properties. And if those changes somehow couldn't be made because of the physical limitations of the site, perhaps it's too small, it's just too close to the abutting residential properties, or the activity is too intense or the activity is too noisy, then the planning board would certainly have the option of saying, no, we can't approve this site plan. The applicant has said in their April 24th letter to the planning board, the one that preceded the workshop, that care has been taken to address the concerns of the Delano Park neighborhood to the extent feasible within the scope and the budget of the project. They also referred to the physical limitations of the site in terms of how the project was designed. And on the fourth page of that previous letter to you from Mr. Carroll, they very candidly said that because of both the physical constraints and the location of the site and the limits of their budget, that the buffering wouldn't really be able to screen the noise impact on the abutting properties. But they say, well, that's to be expected. This is a kind of use which generates a fair amount of noise. Uh, usually it's happy noise. I guess if you're on the team that's losing, it's unhappy noise. But it's a noisy activity. If, if this were a private developer, the planning board probably wouldn't accept that there's going to be an adverse impact on the budding properties because the site is too small, because it's too close to residences, because there's not enough money in the budget, uh, or because that's just the kind of impact the project has. The Planning Board would probably say, no, it's not acceptable. You ought to look for another site. Now here the town is essentially the developer, and certainly it's a worthy cause. There's no doubt that it's a worthy effort. But that doesn't necessarily make it the right location for the effort. There's a, a famous quote in zoning law from the U.S. Supreme Court. It comes out of a case that really upheld for the first time the basic notion of the single-family resident zone, uh, like the RA district where the Guthrie's property is located. The name of the case is Euclid versus Ambler Realty Company. The only reason that's significant is because the kind of zoning we all know today, zoning into districts for single-family, multi-family business and all the rest, is called Euclidean zoning. Euclidean comes straight out of that case. What the court 19... 26. What the court said in that case is it's permissible for a zoning ordinance to have a single-family resident zone exclusively and exclude apartments from the single-family resident zone. Now, clearly there's nothing wrong with apartments per se unless, said the court, they're in the wrong place. And, and the famous quote, and I have to preface this by saying there's no intention here to, to offend anybody, but the famous quote is from uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. They're not my words. The famous quote is that a nuisance may be merely a right thing in the wrong place, like a pig 
in the parlor instead of the barnyard. New playing fields for Cape Elizabeth are undoubtedly the right thing, but we're suggesting on behalf of the Guthries, and I think you'll hear from other neighbors as well, that this is just the wrong place because of the constraints of this site, because of its close proximity, because of its small size, and the inability to pull it far enough away from the residential zone to mitigate the impacts. And we hope that when you look carefully at noise, at hours of operation, the length of the season, the intensity of the activity, and the impact on the budding properties, uh, you will suggest to the town council that this is the right project but in the wrong place. Again, Marion, thank you. Marion Guthrie will fill you in on the details of her specific <coughs> concerns uh, and tie that discussion into these um, uh, factors that the town council has asked you to look at. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Good evening. I'll be as brief as I possibly can. And uh, my name is Marion Guthrie. I live at 8 Delano Park, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. And I want to thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, there were a few other people, first of all, who could not be here tonight. Um, one is my next-door neighbor, Dan Gassetta, who is a former member of the Fort Williams Commission, Advisory Commission. Uh, unfortunately, Dan had a, a death in his family this evening, but asked me to say the following brief words to you. He feels that other areas in Cape Elizabeth could be developed for this sports uh, complex. He is vehemently opposed to constructing a sports complex um, on this particular site, and he feels that the Lions Field site which will be the second site, should be really the first, because the, uh, that would not affect any neighborhoods anywhere. It's far from a uh, neighborhood. So Dan is opposed to this. <coughs> Jeanette Crito, another abutter, uh, has been ill, but she told me to tell you that she stands with um, most of our neighbors in opposing this site. I am here tonight as a very, very concerned homeowner in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm concerned about the, reality, the realities of very, very intense use and very long hours of operation. I am concerned about noise at nuisance levels that will totally destroy the quiet enjoyment of our property and the character of our neighborhood. I am concerned that all of the berms and the trees in the world will not attenuate the noise because there is simply just not enough distance between our homes and this project. Um, the land in Fort Williams Park is actually contiguous with Delano Park, and the only thing that separate, or separates us is a fence. But isn't it interesting that on our side of the fence, and you people um, are well-versed in ordinances and land use issues, we are an RA zone, and with the amount of land on which all of this is being built, just on the other side of the fence, we could have one house. And the comprehensive plan says that 2.7 people would live in that house. Well, look at what is being planned on this three acres just a few yards away. A very intense use. Uh, night after night, month after month, Saturdays, Sundays of intense noise with, for um, people playing sports and spectators. But yet on the other side of the fence, um, if I wanted to have a nursery school, 
um, I would have to go to Ernie McBain and um, notify all of my neighbors within, within 100 or 500 feet. I could have six children. At, that would be the maximum, six. And those children would have to be gone from the premises of my home by 7 o'clock at night. Now, these games will be played until the park closes. Another thing is, um, let's say that on my set, side of the fence, I wanted to build some multiplex housing. Well, <coughs> to even begin to build that housing, I'd need a minimum of 10 acres. Look what we have here jammed onto this three-acre lot. You've got baseball, softball, soccer, lacrosse, which can be played by the teams uh, at night. Um, it can be played by visitors, other teams and spectators um, in, the, in the area and in Cape Elizabeth. Plus, there is a chance that since the town would be in control of this, that uh, perhaps this area could be, become a satellite for the school department, since there is somewhat of a shortage of uh, fields there, and there is no more room to build any fields there. And so, of course, if you're in a butter, you're concerned about all of these people who could use this field, these fields and some very, very long hours. And I would think that before the planning board could make a decision, I think that you ought to try to determine if the school board or this, this, the schools will be um, busing kids over because that just increases parking. Will there be after school games? We don't know. You don't know, and I just don't know how you can possibly um, consider um, parking when you really don't know who is going to use that field. How many people will come? Um, so I guess in closing, uh, and I, I'm sorry I've taken so long. I, I had about an hour's worth, but I just put that in my purse. Um, unfortunately, this project has taken on a life of its own. And the situation has become needlessly complicated at this particular point. And I just hope that as each individual member of the planning board considers the impacts, the facts, and the realities of this project, that you will consider how you would react if this project were to be developed in your own front or your own backyard. And I hope that you will find, as I have found, that as currently planned, this project is totally incompatible with my neighborhood. It would be incompatible with your neighborhood, and essentially, I think that it's quite incompatible with uh, Fort Williams Park. I had more, but I, I, I don't want to take time from other people. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Rouser, and I live in Delano Park. And I have a few comments to make. I'm the mother of two teenage boys who played Little League in Cape Elizabeth, and one of my sons is presently playing on the varsity team, um, baseball varsity at the high school. I support baseball and sports in Cape Elizabeth, but I do not support another field in Fort Williams. Cape Elizabeth already has three fields in Fort Williams. We also have Plaisted Park uh, to the south of the entrance of the fort. Those of us who live in this area, abutting the fort, can hear the PA system very clearly from Plaisted Park. 
the addition of a fifth field in approximately a quarter mile area will put a burden on those of us living in the neighborhoods abutting the fort due to increased traffic, noise, and um, loss of privacy. Fort Williams has always been a quiet park, but it is rapidly changing. We annually have several hundred thousand visitors to the park. The majority are coming during the spring to fall seasons when the sport, these sports fields are used heavily. I don't think it's fair to homeowners who live on this side of town and abut the park to have to bear the burden that another field in this area is going to bring to all of us. The hours are long. I think Marion's points are um, very, I mean, they mean a lot. I don't know if any of you would like to have a fifth baseball or sports field as close to your neighborhood as we are going to have this. It really puts a tremendous burden on those of us who live there. And believe me, I have children. Um, I know how important these things are, and I support fields. But I really think we need to find another place for this one. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Boomer from Nine Delano Park, and um, I too will be brief. Um, and several things that have already been said, uh, I was going to say. But anyway, what this comes down to is a matter of fairness. Um, and I am one of the abutters, and I actually have a couple of visuals that I would like to show you to get started. This first one is, um, on, on the slower side, um, a view from uh, Bud and Mary and Guthrie's porch. And the, I'm standing on the porch taking the picture. This now is the actual field. And you can see this red building is there and there. And the field will go roughly from just beyond these perch trees over towards that, and now that it's been moved that way, it'll be very close to that. And then back out in this direction, uh, the headlight is right there. Okay? And then swing around to um, basically back along this, uh, this line back in here. And then this is just a picture of the parking lot uh, for those who have not been there. Um, the, it, it currently is 80 or 83 spots. Uh, on the master plan that's been mentioned several times, it was originally listed as 135 spots, but as I understand, they built as much as they could and ran into this, uh, this uh, foundation retaining wall or something like that. I'm sorry if I'm to my back to anybody, but it's hard to do this. Um, this is an aerial photograph from the Council of Governments of uh, Fort Williams Park. And roughly the park is, there's Goddard Mansion, runs here, down to Shore Road, across, and then here is the Del Delano Park fence, or uh, edge. The headlight is right there. Um, this, in my mind, puts a much better picture of how much of Fort Williams is going to be taken up by the proposed soccer field and uh, baseball diamond. The other thing that it shows is this is my house right here at Nine Delano Park. Um, this is Dan Gassetta's house, which is, I believe, 20 feet off of the fence. And this is Mary Guthrie's house. And again, somewhat flashing back to those photos, it is a direct line as a center field seat, so to speak, uh, for the uh, for the baseball activity. The other thing that I want to show you, I will actually ask to pass around, is that's an 1895 photograph uh, from the uh, Maine State Museum that shows my house absolutely nothing and then Portland Headlight. 
and um, sailing ships in the background to uh, prove its authenticity. Um, there were some comments at one of the other hearings about previous uses of the fort. Well, my house was built in 1887, and as I said, this is 1895. Um, that's a use that I find perfectly appropriate. And so you, you, you can look at it, and, and uh, I'll come back to that. I believe that mu much of this situation rests on a poorly executed master plan for Fort Williams that was created in 1990. In the beginning of the plan, the area in question was set aside for informal and passive recreation. The, it was also stated exactly the same way in the 1975 plan. Um, somehow during the uh, 1990 plan, it changed to formal multi-purpose ball fields. We abutters were not notified. Um, the copies of the plan were scarce. They still are scarce. I understand there's only 20 copies around. Um, and within this process, the Delano Park Association was not notified. Um, and I know that for, uh, personally because I was the president of the Delano Park Association. And just for the history sense, the Delano Park Association was formed in 1885. The, the town of Cape Elizabeth, I believe, did not even collect taxes until the early 1900s. So certainly we've been around, and, and the uh, previous owners have been. Um, I had no knowledge of this so-called master plan until shown a copy in March by the town planner. Um, at that time, it was pointed out to me that a symptom of bad planning is when local citizens and abutters are not notified. Um, and I therefore charge that this section of the 1990 master plan is invalid. And I strongly suggest that the appropriate committee go back and do it over again with proper representation on, on said committee. Um, I bought my house in um, 1984 and was um, uh, under the impression that these were passive and informal uh, uh, rules, uh, in, in formal, informal fields. And an example of a precedent before that was during 1976, the, um, when the Fort Williams Park and the new zoning for the park was being considered, the Delano Park Association and the abutters, some of whom are in this room tonight, were consulted. And um, we, we, we clearly have a record of that. Um, and um, also, this section of the 1990 master plan was not unanimous, unanimous by that committee that formed it. Um, there was a large minority that uh, did not like it. Um, the other background is right in the 1976 Fort Rim study. On page one, quote, there was a strong consensus has developed over the years that the fort should be first and foremost park. What comes to your mind when someone says P-A-R-K? A place that's quiet, a place that you can go to get away from the hustle and bustle of the world, in Fort Williams, there are already two baseball diamonds here in the, at the bleacher section, and then just recently put out by Shore Road about a month ago, a, a second baseball diamond. Several of these wide open spaces can and are used for field sports. I believe that this end of Fort Williams is the last informal area left that you can get away from cars and parking if you want cars and parking, go to the main mall. Don't come to Fort Williams if this project goes through. Um, and as far as, uh, this is actually an older photograph that doesn't show the, the new parking lot. So already even more space has been taken up by the 20th century evil car. Um, the, uh, let's see. The thing to remember about the parking situation, and I urge you to have a formal, professional parking and traffic study done uh, as the only way to truly know this. 
the um, uh, Fields for Cape Kids uh, first informational meeting admitted that their highest parking situation is at the changeover of games. They're proposing that on Saturdays, for instance, there will be multi-games over the, over the day, and one is scheduled right after the previous one. And what that means is for approximately a half hour or so, you have all the cars, the 20 to 30, that was just alluded to tonight, from the ongoing game. And then the new batch shows up for the second game. You've got to put them somewhere. And again, it's that once this parking lot is full, especially slightly later into the season, then it's going to make a conflict with the people coming from out of town and uh, for, from, from other places to use the uh, visit the headlight and the museum and all that, which will then cause, there will be a call for, well, there's not enough parking, so we have to go and tear up some more area in this quiet end of the fort. Um, the, a couple more qu brief quotes from the master plan. F on page two, Fort Williams is a unique community resource, resource which has irreplaceable scenic, natural, and historic qualities. As such, it should be dedicated to predominantly park. Page three. The committee used the basic policy as a standard to test the appropriateness of any given idea, it examined whether or not a use of the fort was compatible with its unique character, or whether a fort site was proposed simply because the land was there. I believe that is the case here. On page five, consider, considerations for planning. Item two, the area surrounding the fort is predominantly residential and of high tax value. It therefore is important that any activities not detract from the tax base, rather should be consistent with property use, enhance the community aesthetics, and build on the taxable value. And just to relate an experience, about uh, three or four falls ago, where the field exists today, that's not as big as they, they, they would like to see it, it's basically in this area, some football team decided to practice there. And standing in my yard or being in my house, it felt like Super Bowl, where they put the microphone so you can hear the crack of the teams hitting each other. Uh, and it was very startling and very shocking and not in keeping with the peaceful and quiet neighborhood that I had learned to love and had purposely bought into. On page 14, the committee sees the fort as a valued resource for all time that should not be depleted by short-term decisions. I believe this is exactly that. Page 17, whatever use is made in the fort in, in the future, a significant concern is likely to be Shore Road. The question should be asked and answered, how much extra traffic will be generated? And what will its effect on the use of the road? The town is unlikely to be able or want to rebuild Shore Road or to provide a crosstown bypass in the foreseeable future. Also on the same page, the Conservation Commission recommended uh, that no intense development of the fort should be permitted. And this <coughs> looks to me like another intense use. And I will pass around um, one of the pages out of the 1976 um, uh, the plan for the fort. And I think it's self-evident. And while, while you're watching that, uh, while you're looking at that, some of my anger and frustration stems from not being informed in a timely way by the people promoting this change of use. They claim that they couldn't tell us a butters anything before the March 13th um, informational meeting because a plan hadn't been formulated. Well, I don't fully believe that. Um, I have learned that before the Rotary Club, in, in, in its April meeting, the, the local Rotary Club, it was stated that this has been underway for more than a year. And 
they, with the help of some, some town officials, applied for a state funding grant in December of last year. It really doesn't pass a straight face test that you can go and ask the state of, of Maine for $31,000 just on a whim or, or a not completed plan. It just doesn't wash. Um, and some of this leads up to the item of trust. You've heard tonight there, them say that there will be no lights, no scoreboard, no advertising, no public address system, and only one baseball time. I'm not quite, I'm not convinced that I can be, that, that I believe that that won't change. Possibly not this year, but wait a year or two. Wow, the field's there. We want to use it. But the games get called because of darkness. Well, then we've got to put lights in. And again, it starts changing the character of the fort and of the abutting neighborhoods. Uh, let's see. Um, the uh, buffing you've already heard about. Um, and common sense says, let's look at nature. And I have a report that was written and is over in the, in the uh, library that's describing the fort and some of the values that I feel quite attached to. And I quote, To an explorer, the fort is an old attic full of hidden treasures and a testament to the power of nature. The bunkers along the ocean change color and texture with the seasons, gold and red with dandelions and wild columbine in early spring, yellow and white with daisies and black-eyed Susans in July, white with Queen Anne's lace, crusted with goldenrod, and, I can't read the next word, highlighted with purple thistles in September and brown and white in December, all played off the blue of the ocean beyond. Woodchucks nest in rock piles and along slopes. In the tangle around foundations appear, appear remnants of gardens, blazing clumps of daylilies, an enormous patch of crown velch gone wild on the side of the commander's house, wandering specimens of bridal, wreath, snowberry, barberry, and apple, chipmunks skitter in and out of old stone walls and clatter from the branches of oaks. Excuse me, Mr. Boomer? Yes. Um, could you, um, how much longer do you think you're going to be? Oh, about two more minutes. Okay. And I guess my, uh, there, that, that actually brings up the point. This is the second evening that the proponents of this have had your ear. And I, as an abutter, as a taxpayer for almost 11 years, I get sort of shoved aside. I, I, it just doesn't wash quite well. I will actually stop on this common sense because the point here is that this natural scene at the fort, I believe, will be lost forever if we let this intensive development happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boomer, if I may ask you one question, I appreciate the uh, effort to provide visuals for us. Uh, Mrs. Rouser indicated that she thought there were three fields plus Plaisted Park. You mentioned two. Could you point out all three of them again? Okay. Uh, Plaisted Park is just right. outside of, of the fort. There is the baseball diamond at the bleachers. Right. There is the new baseball diamond that's too new for this photo, which is out by Shore Road by the, the uh, Day One building. And then this is, is, the, is the proposed third one. Oh, I thought she had mentioned three and then an additional fourth. But at any rate, thank okay. you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Robert Furbish. I'm an attorney from Portland, Maine, and I represent John Boomer. And I won't repeat uh, what's been said so far. I just wanted to point out a couple of things about the ordinance that uh, I think the Planning Board needs to bear in mind. First of all, this particular use that's being proposed here is what the ordinance calls an athletic facility. 
Uh, it is allowed in the ordinance in, in the business B zone, one of the least restrictive zones uh, in the town. It would not certainly be allowed under the ordinance in the RA zone. And the reason that's important is that Fort Williams Park zone uh, is essentially uh, an attempt to draw a line around the town's own property and I think exempt it from zoning uh, or exempt it from any spec specified zoning that's customary in the other zones. Um, and it leaves it very open and subject to ad hoc determination exactly what uses are going to be permitted. And that's for the town council to decide on a case-by-case -case basis, apparently, with the advice of this board and the Fort Williams Commission. But the pr quid pro quo for that openness um, is that such uses as are going to be approved by the council with the advice of this board have to be compatible with abutting residential zones, and it's specified in Section 19-2-7 that that should be true. And earlier speakers have touched on the ways in which this certainly is not compatible. Customarily in any land use matter, and, and despite the fact this keeps being referred to as an informal process, it actually is not informal in the sense that it's called for in the zoning ordinance. This board has a formal obligation to review this and make a recommendation to the town council. And in doing that, you have to grapple with some of the same standards that the council has to, has to grapple with. And the essence of it, as has already been pointed out, is that these uses need to be compatible with the buzzing, abutting residential zones. In making that determination, since this is a land use matter, it seems to me, again, you have to cast the burden of proof upon the proponent. Um, as in any other situation, a person who comes to this board or any land use board and says, I want to do something, um, has to satisfy you by evidence uh, that he deserves a finding in his favor, whether it's a recommendation or a permit or whatever it is. Uh, and I don't see anything before you that can constitute evidence on all the points that have to be satisfied with regard to compatibility of this field with this adjacent restricted residential area. Uh, and in fact, as has been alluded to before, um, the submission of fields for Cape Kids alluding to buffering, for example, admits that they are going to have a hard time reducing the noise, attenuating the noise. They submit a three-year-old traffic study, uh, at the same time admitting that traffic patterns, uh, it doesn't necessarily reflect traffic patterns that exist today. That's probably correct, but we don't know. There's no evidence. They haven't submitted any evidence on the effect of this proposal on abutting properties, the attributes or the values of those abutting properties. Again, issues of compatibility. Um, I think before this board goes any further and decides whether to make a recommendation, it's got to know what it's recommending. It can't do that without the evidence, which it doesn't have now. And so I want to urge the board to, to make sure that it has the evidence it needs to act intelligently on this matter and advise the council appropriately. As informal as this is, I think the council can be counted on to give significant weight to what you do. And in fact, one of my concerns is that um, in, in the rush to say, well, oh, the council is really going to be the person to approve this, uh, the planning board will make a recommendation without giving thought to these items. And then the council will turn around and say, well, our planning board recommended it. It must be okay. And that's the catch-22 that you're going you're to get caught in. Essentially, no one's going to review it. If you're going to make a recommendation to the council which your ordinance calls for, I think you've got to call for the evidence that allows you to do that in an intelligent way and, and allows the, the recommendation to mean something. And if you do that, I think you'll find that this use isn't compatible with the abuzzing residential RA zone that, that my client and the other neighbors uh, uh, live in. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the Planning Board, my name is Jack Lustig. I uh, live on Kildare Road. <clears throat> I'm not a professional. I did not spend hours, days, weeks, or months in planning this presentation. 
I just make notes as I sit here. Um, I live a good distance from this piece of property. I thoroughly enjoy the piece of property on a consistent basis. My taxes will not increase or decrease a dime compared to what goes on here. <clears throat> but I have some concerns. Uh, when I first heard this, our heartstrings were tugged on the basis that we need a little league field, that there was not enough little league facilities in this town. I come here tonight and I am hearing little league, I am hearing baseball, I am hearing softball, I am hearing soccer, I am hearing lacrosse. Will we be hearing girls field hockey? Will we be hearing rugby? Will we be hearing how many other sports? What is the definition of multipurpose? What is going to happen in this area? What are the liabilities and responsibility that this town of Cape Elizabeth is willing to assume for this facility? What about the administration of this? How are we going to take into the fact that there is an equal chance as well as there isn't that there may be an admission charge put on the facility at Fort Williams. How is this going to be incorporated into this plan? And it just seems a little bit ridiculous to me to be sitting here this evening and seeing this piece of property here, which is probably the most valuable piece of property on the east coast of the United States, and have somebody get up and say, this is a loose group that came up with this plan. And that was your direct quote. It is a loose group. It's ludicrous that we should take this beautiful Fort Williams and start in a plan by a loose group. What is their responsibility and what is the responsibility that this town of Cape Elizabeth is willing to assume for this? I say that this thing should be put on the back burner until somebody could come up with a concise, final plan of exactly what is going to happen. Nothing more and nothing less. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is uh, Randy Blake. I live on Ivy Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm here to uh, speak in opposition to the uh, proposed baseball field, sports field also. I'm not opposed to it because I don't think there's a need for fields. I served on the board of the Little League for several years, was director of finance. I coached soccer for several years in this town. You know, it was always a problem finding a field. So I think we do need to find a solution. However, I'm here because I enjoy the fort, for that, for that section of the fort, where it's peace and quiet. I like to walk there. I like to jog there. I like to take my dog there. My in-laws go down there and walk every day, and I'm sure there are a number of other people that go down and enjoy that section of the fort for the peace and quiet. Ivy Road, Oakhurst Road is a very quiet neighborhood. They could walk in that neighborhood. They don't because it's not as safe, not as quiet as it is down at that part of Fort Williams. A, a foot field, I don't think, will look any less attractive than what there is now. I walked that site last week with people reviewing the planning board, it's an open field, there's concrete there, and you know, it's not bad looking, and a field will be just a little more formal looking. However, what it will do, it will interfere with the quiet enjoyment of the people in Cape Elizabeth who do not have people participating in the sport, who cannot find another quiet place to walk. Granted, they could go to the high school and walk the track. It's peaceful and quiet there at certain times. But this is the only place, I think, in the town of Cape Elizabeth that you'll find a number of residents walking on a daily basis. And I think the, the construction of a field for baseball, which will be used basically all day Saturday. Soccer, I have a son who plays soccer, and thank God he's through with the traveling team this year. We go all the time. We go through late November, and it's Saturday and Sunday. So that field will be intently used through every weekend and many nights after school. 
There are a number of fields already in the fort, and I would hate to see additional fields created there, but if you do need to create one, put it where there's already an open space. As you drive in that main road, there's that large field there. We played t-ball there when my daughter played. I think you could continue to use that field, and it would not be nearly as expensive to make that a baseball field as it is to make this a baseball field. As I say, I'm not opposed to it. I think once you start the development there, and I've written a letter to Mike on this issue, and last week when we were doing this Greenbelt walkway, uh, one of the people as we were walking by didn't know I was close by, and he said, we were walking up by where they just put that new baseball diamond in, and there's a little field there, and the gentleman said, now we can put some packing here to serve that new baseball field. And Mike says, don't say that in front of Randy. I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. Once the field's there, there's going to be increased demand for packing. And I don't know how the packing was created for the fort, uh, for the uh, museum, but I don't think you can, if that was packing was created with a certain number to serve a certain use, I don't think you can double load that packing by having a serve a baseball field, a lighthouse, and a museum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Macklin. I live at 981 Shore Road, and I live right next to Plastid Field. Um, I live 60 feet from home plate. Actually, I live 50 feet from home plate and 60 feet from the loudspeaker. Um, so I know what noise is, and thank God for the town. They took down what trees I had, so I have no buffer zone other than a fence. Um, but I'm not opposed to a field. I'm not necessarily opposed to this field. I just want some of the traffic out of my backyard into somebody else's field. But uh, I guess if it's, we look back, I mean, I'm not a real quote of rules and laws and everything else, but uh, what's going on lately with Oklahoma City and especially in this town lately with uh, local athletes, I don't think that the squeals of kids uh, winning or losing is necessarily a bad sound. Um, even though I'm next door, I, I enjoy the squeal of kids. I come home, and they're there every single night. They're there Saturday, and on Sundays, uh, mothers and fathers bring the kids. I enjoy that. That's a squeal of life. So I guess that's a heck of a lot better than other squeals that we hear. Um, so I don't think that that's necessarily a bad sound, and I don't think that's a nuisance. Um, granted, you're not going to be able to buffer the sound, but you can't buffer the sound of people walking their dogs because the dogs bark. You can't buffer the sound of the, of the foghorn when the foghorn blows. Um, Maybe if I had known that the baseball field was so active, I wouldn't have necessarily bought the house I lived in. But it's there, and it's a great enjoyment. Um, and I think it's such a short period in anybody's life that uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't have a, another Little League field or little kids to play on it. Um, the only other question I have is, Fort Williams is a fort. Could the could federal government come back and make it a fort again? Then what are we going to do? Are we going to be opposed to that? Um, I think that uh, we have to really look at the site, look at what it has to offer us. Maybe we should charge an admission into the park to help pay for all these things that we're trying to do in this town. Um, but I just think that uh, we, need a, a, we definitely need another park, a baseball park, and I don't care where it goes as long as we put one in. But uh, wherever we put one, don't ever allow them to put in a loudspeaker or a, light, a lighted scoreboard. Um, other than that, it's a great place to live. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other members of the public wish to speak? Uh, I'll only be a minute. My name's Lee Rouser. I'm 16, and I'm a sophomore at Cape Elizabeth High School. I play baseball. I'm on the varsity team at Cape High School, and I've played baseball all my life. It's my favorite sport, and I played in Cape Little League. I played in the middle school, and now I play in the high school. I don't know where I'd be without Little League. However, I don't know where I'd be without walking in Fort Williams. You see, I live in Delano Park, right next to Fort Williams. And it's always been a great pleasure for me and for my friends to just walk through the fort, especially the south part of the fort where this this field is being proposed because that's always been a quiet part of the fort. The north end of the fort is where there's usually more people and you can usually go throw a frisbee, run your dog, but the south part's usually where you can go and be quiet, watch the waves crash, you know, listen to the seagulls, 
or just take a nap in the just take a nap in the sun. I think it's the most serene part of the fort, and I think that that's what's great about the fort. I don't think that we should change the whole idea of the fort because that's what we're looking at here, basically. I don't know about the laws and the zoning regulations that affect that. What I'm just concerned about is that we're sort of changing the look of the fort from a place where you can go to relax, to walk your dog, to just be in the sun, to a place where it's going to be loud, there's going to be lots of people, cars, and parking, where it's going to be hard to find a place to relax. And the fort, I think, is basically the last place in the north end of Cape Elizabeth that you can do that. You can do that. So I'm against this baseball field. And I've played baseball, and I know how important Little League is. And I would never want to take this away from children. However, I think we should look for another spot to do this, because this, I think, is one of the last quiet spots in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? public comment period uh, for this meeting is now over. Okay, now I guess we open it to the board for discussion. Does anyone would like to start off? Mr. Dressel? Mr. Chairman, I, I, to begin with, I'd like to have um, Mr. Leahy return to the podium if he could, uh, just to answer a um, question that I have. And, and I just want to make sure, as a planning board, to a certain extent, I, I appreciate all the comments, uh, I, uh, especially um, friend uh, Lee Rosner, um, very articulate uh, job at speaking for a 16-year-old, very good. But to a certain extent, I, I felt a lot of the comments that were presented to um, the planning board are comments that are or should be directed toward the town council according to the letter that, that, that she sent to us. And, and perhaps if you could help us pair through um, uh, that amount of information, specifically those that dealt with um, the board's responsibility of determining use uh, or ex uh, expanded use of an existing use. And uh, those pieces that we, we should pair off as issues for the town council to consider and those that we need to, to, to deal with. <clears throat> Mr. Judge, I'll be glad to uh, give it a try. I'm not sure that I'll succeed wholly, uh, but I'll try. Uh, the Fort District, Fort, Fort Williams Park District is a zoning district, and the uses therein uh, are to be approved by the town council. And they speak of park and recreational uses, speak of non-recreational uses. Uh, another portion introductory speaks of uh, more transient, I'm not, I don't have it in front of me, but more uh, temporal transient uses uh, uh, in the park. Uh, as I said earlier, I think what the planning board is requested to do in its recommendation uh, to the council is to look at a use and the impact of that use on the park. Uh, I think I liken this to a site plan review, which in this case I've said it is apparent that you may have this back to you for ultimately. As to this use or that use, that is a legislative decision, in my view, by the town council. They reserve that. Uh, the park is for park and recreational uses, um, so long as consistent with the long-term uses of the park. Uh, so if if the council finds this to be a recreational use, multipurpose fields as a net recreational use, and they're found to be consistent with the long-term uses of the park, uh, plans for the park, then the council can approve this use. I think the proponents this evening have presented uh, uh, some detail as to the impact of the use, parking and the buffering and all that. And I think my opinion is that's what you're asked to look to. Um, if you found this use to be totally incompatible uh, with the park, that's fine. But I think it is in a different district than the residential A district that abuts it. Um, there are business zones that abut residential districts. I'm not acknowledging this as an athletic facility. It's not the Little League Park. It's Cape Elizabeth Park. It's a town-owned park. It will be used by Little League. It may be used by other groups. Um, so I, I said before that I don't necessarily agree with the thrust of calling an athletic facility, but whether 
the council finds it to be an athletic facility or not, if they find it to be recreational, they go one way and then another, mm -hmm. if they don't. So I hope that that guides you, but I think the you look to for recommendations on the use, and I think it means a specific use like the Fort Williams Advisory Committee has looked to for their recommendation. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the fine line is, is deals with um, the issues of impact. Um, and uh, I guess as one board member, I think we need to, to take a look at um, impact in the areas where the town council has asked us to respond. Um, the issue of um, the use, uh, um, and I think Attorney Leahy is, is, uh, concurs with this, is that that's an issue for the town council to decide. Um, it's an existing use in the park. Um, and I don't think I don't think the planning board needs to dwell on, on the issue of um, whether it's an existing use, an expansion of existing use, or proposed use. Um, I guess my comments will be limited to what we've been asked to do by <coughs> the town council, and that is make comment on uh, the proposal that's in front of us. I guess the issues that, that concern me uh, most. Um, deal with some of those that, that have been brought up by the, the by, through public comment. Um, primarily drainage. Um, there is a cutting of, of slope here that, that needs to be appropriately handled. Um, it will have effect on uh, other portions of the site. Um, issues of, of lighting and, and amplified noise. Um, I, I was one planning board member, and, and it's, it has not been um, uh, proposed that it, the site be lighted or used with uh, amplified noise. Um, I would ask that the town council um, emphasize or, or, or make sure that that's a requirement. To, I think there are some ADA requirements um, going forward with a, with a project that need to be looked at more in depth as far as access to the site uh, from parking, um, specifically the, the soccer field area. Uh, where there are cuts in slope um, that they're appropriately handled both for um, um, young athletes and, um, and spectators. Issues of, of buffering, I, I have been to the site um, and specifically the Guthrie's house. Um, it's directly over the short stop's head uh, and all of the buffering that we can provide uh, I think is not going to cut down um, on, on some of the noise impact uh, to that one about her. Um, I would recommend that the, the, the planning board, uh, that the, the council look um, closely at the issues of, of um, buffering uh, the Delano Park area. Buffering and containing the, the spectator locations, uh, specifically or more specifically for the soccer field. Um, where it, it moves closer, or the spectators may tend to move closer to um, that the, uh, the abutting neighborhood line, um, and deal with areas of team benches and spectator space. Uh, in some way, try to prohibit spectator movement toward that area, both in, in vehicles, which are not intended, uh, and by foot, um, to try to alleviate that. I guess some of the some of the benefits. Uh, yeah, I, over the last few years, I, I no longer have a, a child in, in um, little league. I take a three or four year break before I start all over again. Um, but at any one night, you, you have to see six or seven or five or six games going on in the park. Um, I think there are issues that I think the town council needs to, to be aware of as far as safety uh, of children playing on unprepared fields, uh, specifically the younger children uh, who now are playing on fields that are, are makeshift fields. Um, I will say as one planning board member, I'm not totally in favor of the, the present direction of the, of the use of, of Fort Williams Park, but I don't think that's the issue before the planning board tonight. I think uh, uh, the planning board needs to deal with um, this proposal and the merits and, and what we need to recommend to the uh, to the town council. Um, 
I guess that is it as far as comments that I have. Uh, I, I think what we're trying to aim toward is some type of conditions, so recommendation and with conditions uh, to be drafted in a fairly short period of time. <clears throat> Anyone else wish to comment? I'd like to uh, basically uh, try to begin a discussion uh, which I see as uh, important to this uh, discussion, uh, and that is um, the guidelines that we've been given by 1927. Uh, I'm looking uh, in particular at the first paragraph of that, or of that uh, section, and uh, subparagraph A. Uh, subparagraph B pertains to town council procedure, and subparagraph C says point blank from here on in, town council shall determine. Um, that said, uh, the first paragraph has one of the longest sentences probably ever written. Uh, and it seems to be uh, somewhat broad in scope. Uh, I think for us this evening that uh, we need to determine whether that makes it harder or uh, more straightforward in the application of, uh, of uh, an informal uh, comment on the application. Uh, because it does, in fact, say, uh, mention that uh, almost uh, that, that many uses are intended for the fort, that recreational, uh, recreational and numerous active and passive uses are contemplated. Uh, it goes on to say that those active and passive uses uh, are, are modified by the compatibility with the abutting residential zoning districts uh, language, but then, but then again, that is reiterated further in 1927 as being the province of the town council. Uh, therefore, one of the things that I've been kind of looking at and trying to decide is um, in, the, in the nature of how two zones come together, what it is that we're, we're dealing here with here, and um, I'm not sure that the uses that we've been presented so far by the applicant, in this case the Little League, um, meet the, what I would think is the definition of, of official playing field. Uh, so far we have, been, we have not been told that there would be official uh, school competitive games here uh, or uh, tournaments or, or anything like that. Uh, however, it has, we have been told that, um, that the applicant really cannot guarantee future use of the site. Uh, I think that's something that, uh, in addition to the uh, physical characteristics of the site, uh, that we should uh, delve into uh, in terms of our recommendation, because I think the, what we've been presented to me sounds like it fits the intent of this first paragraph of the ordinance. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. that uh, somewhere along the line, uh, this needs to be flagged for what it's, what it's real, uh, you know, what the actual defined use of the parcel will be. Otherwise, we really can't comment on it. I don't know if anybody else has noticed that, but I'd be interested. Uh, the, uh, the aspects of the, uh, the physical characteristics of what's being proposed on the site uh, have been commented on by the town engineer with respect to drainage and parking and traffic patterns and as compared to other applications that we've seen and uh, I've seen nothing uh, out of the ordinary on this. Uh, what the, uh, what the uh, inherent uh, zen-like character, if you will, of this park should be, whether it is a nature preserve or an archaic ruin or a uh, uh, and an all-out active uh, recreation area for every single person in the town to descend upon. I, again, I think that's uh, uh, part of the language and uh, of subparagraph C. Uh, so I, I see this as being perhaps something that's a, a little bit clearer. I think we should offer up some uh, guidelines on how we see good planning 
being done for such a use and, uh, and try to define better what's going on on the site and, uh, and enter that as our, uh, our approach on this. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else wish to make a comment? Well, since we're proceeding in this direction, I guess I'll uh, continue. I'm um, troubled by several things, I guess. I understand that the 19-2-7 language is, uh, I suppose, mirrors the uniqueness of Fort Williams and the uniqueness of this provision. Uh, I'm accustomed to trying to apply uh, guidelines that are more, that are clearer than what I find here. And I think that we've, we've got several questions that we simply don't have answers to in terms of what we are supposed to be and not supposed to be considering. Um, with respect to recreational uses, I guess, bearing in mind uh, Mr. Furbish's point that the burden of proof is on the applicant, I still would like to try to put on my um, site plan review hat to the best of my ability, as suggested by our town council, and simply try to look at this as though it were a complete application before us on site plan review, if that's what our expertise is that's being called upon here. And I guess my um, Concern. I, athletics were very, very important to me when I was growing up, and I would certainly, uh, you know, approve of the of the idea here. And obviously, these people have given a tremendous amount of volunteer time to developing the proposal to the extent that it is developed at this point. I, my concern is that this is a. I think it would be fair to say a very intense use on a very unique parcel that would make me look very specifically at concerns particularly about buffering location and noise. Um, I happen to live on Wood Road, which is not that far away from Plaisted Park, but it's not that close either. And I can certainly hear kids from, from time to time uh, where I'm located. And my situation is not anything to compare with what's being suggested on the, in the proposed application. I don't think there is any way that you can really buffer with respect to noise. And I think that would be my major concern for suggesting that perhaps we should consider not recommending this as a proposal to the town council because the noise would be, by definition, uh, intrusive at a level that just simply shouldn't be permitted in an RA zone that bucks up on something like this. I really would hope that, uh, that the applicants could find and would consider trying to find another location that would be more acceptable. Uh, in terms of parking, I don't think that uh, I think that that's something that should be looked at further, but is probably not insurmountable. I agree with uh, Mr. Edsel's concerns about drainage and the other uh, concerns that he mentioned. Uh, I think there has been a laudable effort on the part of the applicant to improve the buffering from the first plan that we saw, but I'm still just concerned basically about something that no matter how much buffering there is, it, it will not go away. Thank you. Ms. <clears throat> Carlson. There's no doubt in my mind that what we've been hearing tonight will have tremendous impact on the Ford as we see it today. The question before really the town council is first for us to tell them it's going to have tremendous impact, but also to tell us or through a public meeting whether that impact is correct or not. The impact will be noise. There's no doubts about that. There's a need for buffering. 
There's a need for sight, moving ground around, all that kind of thing. Uh, the traffic up the narrow road. There is tremendous impact that will be experienced on Fort Williams if the Little League activity and the softball and the soccer league goes through. So I think it's very simple, but perhaps the planning board could just say there will be tremendous impact on Fort Williams, on Little League and soccer and that kind of formalized activity going there. But town council has a public hearing. We finally get back into it with a site plan review. And if it's so approved, we'll do our best to meet all those issues, all those impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The number of issues that were raised tonight uh, by those speaking against this project uh, that uh, I'm now very much aware of, I believe we should identify these and also the issues that the planning board members may have as far as issues may we, we would want to cover in depth when it came back as a complete package. Uh, I believe it's also going to be the town council's decision to make as to whether this area of the park remain in its present state or whether it be allowed to be developed in the future. Uh, once that decision is made, the planning board will act accordingly if an application comes back to the board. Thank you. <clears throat> um, prior to the workshop, um, we received in our packet a letter from Michael McGovern um, regarding how we were to deal <clears throat> with this um, application. And it's, you know, we've been charged with providing informal comments on a proposal. Um, it is not the desire of the town council for the planning board to undertake a site plan review or hold a separate public hearing. Well, one out of two isn't bad, I suppose. Um, but nonetheless, the board should particularly look at buffering, lighting, noise impact, traffic pat patterns, and parking. Um, and we, they would like to have a response <coughs> by the end of May. Well, just to have one, I guess one of the things sort of to add here. I grew up in this town, <clears throat> and when I was a, a young person, Fort Williams was still a fort, and I had some good friends who lived in Delano Park. Um, at that time, they still had target practice um, in the fort, which was done down by the, uh, the lighthouse. And I can remember as a young kid, we were still enthralled by being allowed to go in there and look for empty shell casings, etc. The use of the fort at that time was very, very noisy. There were a lot of people there. They had drills. They had um, marching bands. You name it, they had a mock uh, invasion that, with landing craft coming up on the beach um, and having machine guns go off and all that sort of thing, shooting blanks, obviously. Um, it seems to me that um, a ball field um, is a fairly unintensive use of this particular part of the site, as opposed to army trucks and everything else that used to be there. And it seems that uh, Delano Park, I guess, was incorporated in 1885, um, or organized, rather, or incorporated, one or the other, um, was always been a very desirable place to live, still is, always will be. Uh, I don't believe that uh, a ball field is going to seriously impact that. So we need to get on with what we've been asked to do, and that is to provide informal comment to the town council, and I think that's the step at the stage where we are right now. Mr. Wilcox. Uh, one other thing that I think we should, uh, in that vein, emphasize to the count, to town council is in terms of our request for the noise impact, uh, the representations that have been made, although not guaranteed because the applicant is not the eventual owner or user of the site, uh, which include uh, representations that there will be uh, no loudspeaker systems or you know, tournament-type large, uh, large crowds or grandstands built uh, be reinforced 
in our in our perception of what's being presented to us. Uh, I think one of the things that's been a concept that's been presented tonight is fairness. And I think traditionally this board has done very well in recognizing that fairness to applicants, even though they may be rather diffuse and loose-knit, uh, they still do have standing before this board. And they have the right to beneficial use of their property or the property in question. Uh, I know of no noise ordinance in any town that says you have to have, you can have zero decibels at your lot line. Uh, I don't think anything like that would be either reasonable or fair. Um, uh, what seems to be uh, presented here tonight does not seem to be presenting something that would be on the level of uh, what most municipal ordinances have for lot line type noise conditions. Typically, uh, they're geared toward larger amounts of permissible noise during the day and less amounts at night. Uh, I think with the uh, absence of lighting on this site, we're, we're back to zero at night, if you will. So I think that's pretty something that if we can uh, get that to be something that is uh, entered into the, the record, uh, will advance the uh, understanding of this use a lot more. And during the day, uh, it, while it may be true that there's nothing you can do to block noise, uh, there doesn't seem to be a large... Uh, a large uh, generating source of noise here. Mr. Chairman, I think if we could, maybe there's, there's two documents that sort of summarize the, the issues that the council is interested in, in response from us, and then we certainly can add to that if we wish. But I, I think in, in the interest of trying to get something to them, that we can take a look at this, both the April 11th uh, memo from uh, uh, or a letter from Mike McGovern, and um, the recent, this May 16th memo from Maureen O'Mara. If we could sort of combine the issues and then, then try to reach consensus on each issue, um, have Maureen um, jot the notes, and then we can get some type of communication uh, moved forward to the um, council. If I could, if, if we can go through those issues, first in the, in the April 11th uh, letter under buffering, are there items under, you see there's a discussion section in Maureen's May 16th memo? Yep. Are there issues there that we can combine the, with that? In other words, we'll take topic one, call it buffering. Other issues that we can combine with that um, possible landscaping between slab and road? Okay. I don't know. I, wasn't, I apologize for not being at the, the, the uh, workshop, so I'm not sure. <clears throat> exactly which slab and road they're talking about, but I assume that that's on the south end of the, yeah. at the pro proposed location. Okay. If we, as, as a second topic, if we could take lighting and perhaps combine with lighting level of intensity of use of site, seasons, days, hours, use of, of Move to the third topic we'll call noise impact. I think we'll just leave that as its own topic, maybe. And it's appropriate that it's right under light level of use, seasonality, and so forth. Then number four, I can't see through my bifocals, traffic patterns. We can take the, the traffic control as town Okay, we just have traffic, <coughs> town control, etc. cetera. Um, parking has its own separate topic. It's five topics. Is there any way to, to – we have maintenance of grass insurance. Um, help me out here, board members, uh, amount of storage and slap between – Field and I guess that's what they're talking about. That's the municipal storage area. I think we can lump those others in, in a sixth. I won't call it miscellaneous, but uh, insurance. Are there, are there other items to, to go? 
perhaps to be preceded by a, a general comment by consensus of the board. Okay. Let's come back to that last. Mr. Chairman, let me, do you want to yeah, I'm, delegate some, some comment on buffering? Well, uh, maybe we, we can touch on lighting first, because that seems to be a sure. uh, uh, very important issue here. Is there any way, if we recommend to the town council, this is a question for either the town attorney or Maureen, um, that can they for forever prohibit lighting for night play? Is that something that we can do, and is it likely to be able to be enforced? Just before Tom speaks, keep in mind that this is an advisory board, <laughs> and you know this is property that is owned by the town, and it's controlled by the council. Uh, so what you can do is, with with all the weight of your advice, uh, recommend to the board, uh, recommend to the council that there be no lighting installed on the site, and and I, I believe that that is the most that you can do. I agree. I think you could say that um, lighting is an issue. It, 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 it affects buffering. It affects noise impact because of the use of it. It's a concern, and the proposal calls for no lighting. Thank you. I think Mr. if we can paraphrase Mr. Leahy's uh, comment, we can make that the recommendation. That it's an issue. Um, I, I don't know that he said that it would recommend that... that uh, Recommend that the council prohibit lighting in perpetuity. I mean, they, like you say, we're just an advisory board in this, uh, this role, and that's what we recommend. It has the weight of our advice. Mr. Mr. Cotter? Just as a reminder, the park's policy right now is that the park close and all activities cease at sunset. We might want to restate that to the council with our support. Just that would definitely limit the use of the park during those periods of time when neighborhoods like it quiet. Thank you. Um, okay. Maureen? This may not help, but perhaps what, what the board may want to do is someone may want to jump in and make a motion and then um, just make a statement that you would like to be attached to that motion and perhaps by consensus the board can add as many statements as it sees fit. Uh, for example, Mr. Cotter just made a suggestion about uh, maintaining the, the current policy on closing the park at sunset, and, and you know the rest of the board just by consensus agrees with that. We can just start making this, this list of statements. Mm -hmm. um, if someone wants to start by at least making a motion that, that gets it going. <coughs> sure. I'll get there. <laughs> okay. um, would the board like to take a, a break for five minutes? Right. Well, Got some notes down individually, then maybe we can arrive at a consensus. Yeah, if we might do it in those five or six different uh, topics, and I'll try to get some preamble to it. Mm-hmm. And be a good pack of that. Yes, uh, I'd like to make a statement tonight, make it part of the record, that
that uh, before we had our workshop on the second of the month, I walked Fort Williams often, so I'm up there and I'm quite familiar with it. But I still went up there to see what was where this field was going to be. So I did park up there behind the schools, and I did walk down, and I was wandering around. And I just wanted to be part of the record that I, uh, John Boomer, I found out later, when he introduced himself, was also there taking pictures. And the only topic of conversation was what the yellow ribbon was there, because I saw this yellow ribbon. And I did say to Mr. Boomer that I was on the planning board, and I was not in a position to do any discussion of what was going on. So I did not find out. I did learn he was a butter, because he did mention that. But he did not point his house. I don't know where he lives. And so I just want that as part of the record, that uh, that meeting did take place. It was just something that happened as I was going, kind of finding out more about what we're talking about tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bretzel? Sure. I have a, a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented, the planning board makes the following recommendations to the town council regarding the proposed Fort Williams multi-purpose field. The following comments and conditions are added as recommendations to the town council by consensus of the planning board. Colin. Okay. That's the motion. Excuse me? That's, you, that's the motion. Okay, then we're going to add as. Right. Okay. So it ends with a, with a colon. So uh, okay. the intent of the motion is to add the, the uh, recommendations. Okay, do I have a as second? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Mm hmm. Ms. Dressel, would you like to start off since you initiated this? I think we need to vote on the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't think we can vote on the motion, though, without knowing what the conditions are. Can't, we, we've, we've got the phraseology of then, the motion. Then as discussion, we can add conditions. Is that the appropriate way to handle yeah. the motion? Okay. I, I will begin as discussion um, and look for consensus of those phrases to add to the motion. Okay. Then we'll second it. Okay. Um, Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All those in favor of the motion, please raise the right hand. I don't think no. we can vote on no. the motion. No. no, the intent was to wait until we get the conditions listed and as oh, discussion sorry. on this motion. I'm no, I, I, I thought we needed to vote on it as well, but I think as discussion we will add, as we would normally, amendments to an motion, um, okay. the, the conditions. It's an awkward way to do it. But, um, <clears throat> Okay, the first um, item was, was it lighting or is it buffering? I buffering was the, the first condition. I'll offer a, a beginning statement uh, just to, so we get started. Um, as recommendation number one, that utmost uh, care be taken in consideration of the existing abutting properties and the recreational nature of the park to provide appropriate buffering to the neighboring areas, parking, and spectator locations. Okay, would, uh, excuse me, this is okay. My only comment on that is that I don't know what you mean by the uh, recreational nature of the park. We're providing buffering to protect the neighboring residential area, but, and, and you mm -hmm. provided for that, but then you also wanted to take into consideration the recreational nature of the park, and the recreational nature of the park is what is well, an issue we here have recreational people. uses and non-recreational uses. Um, I, I guess the intent of that, and, and we can make it more clear if you, if you wish, and certainly willing to, um, that the buffering has to do with those issues of recreation, not the non-recreational uses. Um, and, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, but aren't we buffering everything that has to do with the park from the residential areas, or are you trying to buffer one use within the park from another use in the park? No. 
not not exist or not uh, use not buffering use from use, but simply the the the. I, I suggest if we just took out the recreational use okay, of the park, fine. that it might clarify the the first uh, sure. provision. So scratch the uh, the phrase and the, the and the recreational nature of the park. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. Okay, the word appropriate. Um, I'm not sure if I know what that means. I mean, I I know what it means, <laughs> but I'm not sure what the intent is. Um, Where did I have it in there? I... Um, appropriate um, buffering. buffering. Okay. Um, I, again, I, 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 it's a, care, a case of how much detail the planning board wants to provide. Do we say that, that we recommend a minimum of 25 foot, uh, 10 inch? No, GH, please. Uh, we... uh, <laughs> can we just say fir trees at you know a maximum amount of buffering? He's, he's got utmost in there. I don't think we can get any higher than yeah. that. I, I mean, that, that's the extent. I mean, it, it, it was a large impact. Um, Why don't you and, read it again? Maureen, do you have it written? <laughs> Let's see. Um, that the utmost care be taken consideration of abutting properties. Um, and, I, and, and what you've said that you want appropriate buffering to the neighborhood, uh, parking lots, and spectator locations. So, why don't we say the utmost care be given to providing maximum buffering for? So it would read that the utmost care be taken to provide the maximum buffering to neighborhood to the neighborhood um, parking from to the neighborhood for parking lots, the field, and spectator locations. Buffering of the neighborhood buffering. from. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Is that both visual and sound buffering? <clears throat> Again, we've, we've, we've talked about utmost uh, care be taken, and I, I think without saying 15-foot fence, uh, you know, without being specific, uh, I, I this, again, is, you know, advisory to uh, the council. What are key issues that we want them to make sure that they give consideration to? Mr. Chair, if I can be heard, I thought we were going to consider noise as a separate category to emphasize it, and that's what I'd like mm -hmm. to continue to see us do. Okay, do we have a consensus on the first for buffering? I'd Mr. like Wilcox? to I'd like to make a comment for consideration, and that is. Um, I think buffering the parking lot is something that is, the, since the parking lot itself is outside the scope of this project and it does not seem to be the amount of parking uh, contemplated for this application does not exceed or overburden the existing parking lot, then I'm not sure we need to include standards for buffering of somebody else's parking lot. In essence, this is off the project project limit, and as far as we're able to ascertain from the application, it's not uh, going to overburden the parking lot. So we don't have a higher, that much higher level of use at the parking lot. So I would just wonder if that's really necessary. I, I think that's a good comment, and whether it's a part of this site or not, um, it can be stricken as, a, as an item, I, I think, because we're not concerned about that at other parking locations on, on site. Uh, if it is an issue at site plan review time, if we ever get to that point, then yeah. that can be dealt with at that yeah. time. But that's not a real key recommendation, I think, at this point to forward to the, I, I agree to strike the parking area. Maureen? No, I, I don't have anything to say. Okay. I'm just counting. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, 
Okay, we have a consensus on that with the parking. Very I, I don't know how much we want to work on the consensus. I think I'm going to have to vote against. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, help us use the wording, but I do feel quite strongly about not forwarding uh, an affirmative recommendation. So my suspicion is that we can put a lot of effort into a consensus, and I don't know whether I'll be able to, to vote for or against. So maybe we shouldn't worry about the consensus okay. as much as right. just a <clears throat> keeping right. going. Okay, can we move on to lighting then? Would you like to um, propose something, Mr. Russell? Or would you I'm like to see what I wrote here? I, I think if I could speak to that, I thought we had addressed that once before, and that was that the uh, we we note with favor that the proposal calls for no lighting whatsoever, no electrical power to the premises, and we recommend that the prohib that the council prohibit lighting um, at the ball field. Can we say that lighting be prohibited? Is that too simple? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather say electric power. That prevents many things. Just no electric power will be brought to the site. No electric power or lighting be brought to the site? Yeah. Okay. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the next item was intensity of use. Um, Noise impact, I think, was what I had written down. Well, but maybe we combine we combine those two documents, and we're we're to in, include the level of intensive use of the site, seasons, days, hours, use of field, and lighting. So, in conjunction with uh, the comment about no electricity to the site. Um, what else do we need to add to that to forward a recommendation by consensus of the board uh, dealing with intensity of use of the site? In other words, tournaments, seasons of play, um, days of the week, uh, hours, those types of things. What, what can we add as, as a general recommendation or specific? Bearing in mind that from November to March, we're really dealing with sort of 9 to 5 because the sun goes down at 5. 530. Well, as a practical matter, November to March, the, in theory, the field will be covered with snow, so cross-country skiing would probably be the most intensive thing. That's <laughs> quiet. I, I believe Mr. Cotter made the statement earlier that, that, the, that the town council continue the practice of closing the park at dusk. I, I think that's a good comment to add as a recommendation because it covers a lot of issues. It, it, the one thing I would, um, do it, do, As a board, do we want to limit the use of, of that athletic recreational location um, to certain months of the year, April 15th to November 15th? Uh, or is that pretty much driven by the climate season, I would suspect. Yeah. I mean, if we don't need to make recommendations, I don't. I don't think, think it's needed. Okay. <clears throat> I, I w one thing that I have in here has to deal with uh, recommendations uh, dealing with um, use of that field for tournaments, playoff games, where it's even more intense than um, uh, typical week-to-week -week little league soccer use. Um, I have a daughter in, in, in travel soccer, and, and we go to other locations, um, and there's apt to be, you know, hundreds of teams in one town for a weekend. Um, does the planning board want to make any recommendation regarding that field for other than town use, I guess, is uh, town team use? Is that too restrictive? We just... Hello. If, excuse me, Mr. Okay. Chairman, if I maybe heard one point that I forgot to make earlier that Mr. Edsel has reminded me of is that in my perusing of guide, guides for the discussion tonight, I did go back to the comprehensive plan of uh, 1993, 
And on page 38, at recommendation 18, there's a provision for adding an adequate level of recreation facilities and services at the neighborhood level. Um, town notes that it has abundance of state and regional park land and parks, but that there are very few parks and recreational areas located in the various neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth. And the recommended implementation was the Broad Cove neighborhood and southwestern and northwestern sections of town should be targeted for the creation of future parks and open space areas. Um, so I guess that makes me hope that to the extent that we can keep this a neighborhood something that we restrict um, play to those and encourage other neighborhoods in town to build their own um, park and open spaces and ball fields. Hmm. Do you want to um, make a formal recommendation on that, or is that just a comment? Uh, I, there's a motion on the floor now, so I don't think that I want to amend. I don't want to make that comment a part of this particular motion. Um, and again, without getting too specific, I'm quite concerned about noise and in the, in the intensity of use. So whatever the board feels would be comfortable in terms of a recommendation to minimize the impact, I would certainly go along with. I guess we're, we're looking for some type of consensus. In other words, do we want to forward some type of, of recommendation that it's limited somehow to um, only community use versus exclusive use of Cape Elizabeth teams. How, how are the two fields that are existing there now scheduled? I mean, I suppose that if there's just a pickup game of some kind, it's there, but it's sort of hard to have a pickup game of, uh, you know, 18 people without passing the word ahead of time. Um, do you schedule through the town hall now or what? Doesn't the baseball organization schedule the use of the field? I think if you're... I think if you're outside of a maybe patch. Maybe we should ask uh, the applicant here. Yeah. I'd be glad to answer that. Um, typically, I think the in the spring of the year, the baseball association makes a formal request to the town manager for to reserve certain fields, and I think it's primarily the parade field and the the field back behind the Girl Scouts are the only two fields that are reserved. Uh, the other fields and the other teams that do play there and practice there. It's really, I mean, it's kind of first come, first served, and uh, typically there isn't that high level of use by other um, visitors to the park to preclude that use. Um, but in general, you know, on a, on a typical Monday or Tuesday night, there's probably three or four games from T-ball to double-A level, and uh, there's probably three or four other teams that are practicing on the other end of the parade field out there. But the but the town manager and the town council actually uh, guide the the use and reservation of those fields. So I guess <clears throat> then the question would be if you have this other field that would be one of the fields that would be scheduled as well. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. My my intent was there that that currently with softball baseball um, tournament playoff games which often do not include a Cape team are played at. Placed at field, and, and I think that that should continue as, as the major major league little league field, um, and that that just adds to the intensity. We'll just keep that intensity at that location. Um, it is the the tournament level field by design, has dugouts, um, systems, and so forth. Um, that, in the interest of retaining a lower level, um, that um, it, we recommend uh, that it be for exclusive use of Cape teams. Now, that's a, a fine line, for instance, in a soccer team. If the, a Cape team is playing a Scarborough team, does that qualify there? I, I, I don't want to get into the, the intricacies of that, but I, I think the intent is that one way to, to, to maintain a reasonable level of use without um, um, overriding uh, over too extensive use is to keep it to um, town-oriented athletic uh, uh, the recreational activity. Not to be hired out, for instance, to, to the Portland rugby team or the uh, Sea Dogs for, for practice field. Well, they couldn't practice on that anyway. But, <laughs> but you get the point that it, it's used for specifically. Yeah, I have another question for the applicant. Um, 
<clears throat> I know that the Little League playoffs would be played uh, at Playstead Park. The, the soccer facility, would that be superior to the other soccer fields in town? So the, it would be likely that this would be used as opposed to another field? Or would the other fields be used, you know, on a first, you know, first preference basis? Well, again, I think that the, uh, the town council is really the, the guiding force in that, and they're the ones that are going to either allow or restrict uh, use of these fields. Now, this field clearly, when it's, when it's first built and established, will probably provide a, uh, a higher quality field than some of the fields, say the lower soccer field behind the high school, which is in really pretty bad shape right now. Um, but, uh, you know, public works typically does all they can do and uh, do, does a pretty good job at maintaining the ball fields in town. Um, you know, it's, it's not our intent to, to try to reserve or uh, restrict this field for either the Youth Soccer Association or Little League. I mean, that's really up to the town to, mm -hmm. town council to decide. At the same time as an advisory board, they're looking to us for advice what they, they may consider. And I think um, yeah. all I'm looking for is consensus on the board here whether they want to perceive that or not. It's not. Well, I guess we can, we can suggest that they restrict it somehow. Can we, can we include in our recommendation that we suggest that they restrict its use to that presented to this board and it not be expanded beyond that? Excuse me, I might be able to answer that for you. My name's Karen Dunphy. I live on Columbus Road, and my husband is president of the Travel Soccer Association here in town. Um, regarding tournament use or postseason play, in my experience, and I have two kids in the travel program, uh, that's been, as Steve mentioned, there are lots of teams. They are held on sites that have multiple fields. So I don't, I wouldn't expect this to be considered a desirable site because it's only one field. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You might want to limit to league activity where Cape Elizabeth is a participant in that particular activity. In other words, it would have to stay within the league. That would cover when you have a championship game while Cape Elizabeth <clears throat> is on the championship. The issue with, for instance, Little League Baseball, Cape may be uh, um, involved in that league play, but Cape won't play on their home field uh, unless they I don't know how that whole draw works, but I think, again, it's an issue that, that needs to go to the, the, the town council as to any limitation. The, the role that we play is, is do we choose to make any recommendation toward that limitation, limitation um, as an advisory board? We have a whole different role here that we're playing in, in this uh, case. If it's not a big issue, then I don't think that it, it's certainly not reaching consensus and then need not be added. Why don't we say that the council, we, we recommend that the council should consider minimizing the intensity of use and the impact of noise by such things as restricting the hours of play, the days of use, uh, the um, teams to, uh, only to local Cape Elizabeth teams, which gives the suggestion of what it is that we're thinking about. Get that, Maureen. Yes. And does, doesn't the town council and the town manager now govern who plays there? I don't know. That's what I understood. I would assume. Okay, I've, oh. I've, I've got two different Mr. statements. Leahy. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm just afraid we're going down a road here with the evening going on. Um, and as a town attorney, I think I've given my advice before, but I think what you're doing is you're going to make a recommendation for or against this use and you were going to express your concerns and some guidance that they may adopt as far as an official vote. If, if they vote in favor of it, they may impose conditions. So they want to know what you're concerned with this proposal. I think to talk about things that aren't on the table, we could be here a, a long time. So I would recommend that you not divert totally from the path you're going, but start with a recommendation, express concerns, and maybe some guidance, but I think to try to get consensus on all the guidance and on all those concerns, uh, it's quite unwieldy. I'm, I'm looking at Maureen trying to write these comments down as they come, and it's very, very hard, I think, to have this come out. So I would recommend, I, for your consideration, you have a uh, motion for recommendation and a list of concerns, but I think we ought to try to keep those 
concerns and some guidance because it's, it's, it's going to be unwieldy in, in its final form. Did we have a consensus on the board to proceed in that direction? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Where do we leave off? By this <clears throat> If we're finished with number three, I think the fourth concern was traffic. Maureen, what do you have under uh, three? I've got two options. Airing away all of the um, incidental issues of. of uh... Under, um, I've got right now. I've got four different statements. Okay. Um, and the fourth statement I would uh, is the most recent one by uh, Board Member McKay, which is. Uh, the Council consider minimizing the intensity of use and noise by restricting the hours of play, the days of use, and restricting use of the field to CAPE teams. Next. I can't read that. Oh, traffic. What were we adding to traffic? Traffic patterns. Um, Traffic control is the town responsibility. In that location, it is anyway. Um, I guess the issue is. What is I mean, the we, issue? We discussed saying that the parking lot wasn't even a part of the application, so it's mm -hmm. pretty hard to comment on <laughs> traffic. It is. And, and the traffic, um, there's, there's, for the existing use, there's not really any. Increase of traffic is just a dispersion of where the traffic flows to, and parking is the same issue. Uh, well, but but to the extent that the parking lot was created for another use and is being, you know, sort of appropriated for this use, I think maybe we could just say that our concerns are traffic, and that the uh, that the, the applicant should pay particular attention to uh, issues of traffic and parking. I, I don't know how to say it any more than mm -hmm. that because we don't have much more specific information than that. <clears throat> Not even sure it's a, uh, an issue. Um, I don't see it as no, an My only point is that parking be limited to existing parking lots, and that would prevent the expansion or the addition of another parking lot. I personally want to so. limit vehicle use in that park, so let's just keep it in the existing parking lots and leave it there. Fine. Some, some statement indicating yeah. that, the, that no other parking uh, associated with this proposal be considered. <clears throat> Work on that, Maureen. How about parking for this proposal shall be limited, should be limited to existing parking lots? Period. Next. The next one is parking. We've already talked about that. I don't think any of the rest of them are really concerns. We had a general category, but mm. I, don't, I don't hear anybody being concerned about insurance particularly or... Anything else? I, don't think I, I think what we need to, to top this um, the, is the proposal whether this board, by consensus, wishes to um, recommend the use or extent or, or expansion of the use. We have a motion, correct? Would, would you like me to read the statements that you have that could be added to the motion? That would be great. Okay. <clears throat> One. Would you read the introduction to the motion again? Certainly. Uh, the motion that was made by Mr. Etzel was be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the Planning Board makes the following recommendations to the Town Council regarding the proposed Fort Williams multi-purpose field. One, that the utmost care be taken to provide the maximum buffering of, of, maximum buffering of the neighborhood from the playing field and spectator locations. Two, uh, that no electric power or lighting be brought to the site. Three, that the Town Council continue the policy to close the park at dusk. Four, that the Council consider minimizing intensity of use and noise levels by restricting hours of play, days of use, and restricting the use of the field to Cape teams. And five, um, the parking for this proposal should be limited to existing parking lots. I think Attorney Leahy had asked us to make a proposal whether we favored it or not, but the, the, the conditions, the recommendations imply that, that uh, it is in favor of, or, or that the council consider those issues going forward. I don't think we need to say 
Do we need to? You do. We do need. Yes. You're not. Okay. Um, I think we need to precede those uh, recommendations by a statement. Um, if, through the chair, um, if you if you choose to recommend the field, you could simply amend the motion to say that the planning board recommends um, the construction of the ball field um, with the following comments. What, what do we call this field? It's a multipurpose? It's, yeah, the Fort Williams multipurpose field. Okay. I'd ask that, that uh, my motion be um, amended to read, be it ordered that based on the plans, materials submitted and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the construction of the Fort Williams multipurpose field and makes the following recommendations to the town council regarding the proposed Fort Williams multipurpose field. Followed by those. <clears throat> As read. As read. With all due respect, I'm looking at Michael McGovern's letter of April the 11th, and to quote him, is the desire of the town council for the planning board to provide informal comments on the proposal. What is meant is not to do a site plan review or to hold a separate public hearing, but the board should look at those five issues, and the town council would like a response. Um, and the... 19-2-7 says in A that the council shall submit any proposal to the planning board for the purpose, well, of, for considering current proposed uses for review and recommendation. So I guess I'll take it back. I was thinking they were just asking for comments. Mm. Okay. Do we have a second on the motion? Yes, Mr. Um, Wilcox seconded. As amended? I, I have a... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to speak for you. <laughs> should, I, should I hold discussion on it? You have Until comment? It's seconded? Yeah. You have Mr. comment? Chairman, I have a comment. For this comment. Before the comments. Come. Okay. Well, the motion is amended is the one that you just read? Uh, that the town planner has just read? Well, it was a yes. combination. The only amendment I made to that was to add in the, the, the original <laughs> motion the recommendation for the construction of Fort Williams multi-purpose field. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to second the motion. Thank you. Comments? Mr. Wilcox? I, I have a comment. I think that uh, this being an intro and a an overview of, of presenting our recommendations, but followed by concerns, uh, it seems to me that it uh, might be uh, better uh, expressed if we said something in that recommendation that the application um, presents a, a recreational use or a use similar to that described, similar to those described in the first paragraph of 19-2-7 just to clarify that we're reviewing this under that section of 19.27, which does talk about uh, recreational uses and non-recreational uses not permanent in nature, which I think this application fits into as it's presented so far. What you're suggesting, I think, Mr. Wilcox, is a finding of mm. fact. I think once we open up that's, the findings of fact, then we have a whole list of things. So, you know, that's, that's where it belongs. Okay. Yeah. Can we can we add? Man? Certainly. Or that we reviewed I, it. No, we I reviewed would suggest it you add it. I add it. You add it before you vote on the motion. If you want to make that a formal finding of fact. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think we're being asked to do that. Mm -hmm. So. I think it might might be a good idea to say, sort of cite the standards of the zoning ordinance. We did use in reviewing. I think it might be important to to state in the in the motion the the standards of the zoning ordinance which were used for reviewing, uh, because we have not touched on 
several of the things that are in 1927C, and uh, it perhaps might be might better express what we've done if we said so, or or just not saying anything might just not be not be necessary. It might just stand as it is. But does anybody else have any? Mm. <coughs> Mr. Leahy, excuse yeah. me. He's already oh. addressed that. I've given my advice in the letter that those standards at, at C, 1 through 5, are really for the town council, yeah. and that they're looking for a recommendation from this board, I believe, uh, to be based on more land use impacts, which you've done. Right. Um, I don't think it's necessary, therefore, to go through those at this okay. time. It opens up more, okay. uh, more issues. That's fine. Yeah, I think, according to the tone of the letter that we received from, from uh, the town manager, Mike McGovern, and taking into account uh, council's um, recommendations, I think keeping it on an informal recommendation basis, uh, I think we have said as much as I would like to propose in the motion at this point in time anyway, without going through a whole listing of findings of fact um, and being more detailed in, in recommendation. I think, as, as Councillor Leahy said, um, those whole, all of those issues um, in C1 through 5 are issues for the the council, based on the advice that we give them, uh, are, are decisions for them to make. We're saying these items have impact. We want you to look at these. We're the planning board. Please take a look at these. They make a decision. If it need be, it comes back here for, for site plan. We we'll go through the whole process of public hearings and da da da, da <coughs> if it ever gets that far. Yeah. I think we may be overworking this a little bit. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion that has been seconded. Yes, we do, Mr. Comment? Chair. I, I do have an additional comment on that motion, and that is the intro to that was, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, and that's the normal introduction that we do for them going ahead to do findings of fact, maybe what we could do is say, based on the plans and materials submitted, strike the and the facts presented, and then just say, applying the, you know, 19-2-7, here are our informal comments. If you wanted to try to tie it in that way, I think we shouldn't do anything more than that. I don't... Just in defense of my little facts presented, um, <laughs> the reason I have always included that is so that it, it acknowledges that any comments that anyone has made, including public comment, are part of the record. Yeah. Yes. So all the diagrams, everything okay. we look at is I don't think strongly fact. about my mm -hmm. suggestion. I withdraw. Okay. Uh, but you certainly could, you know, and, and in accordance with Section 19-2-7. Uh, it was only, it doesn't make that much difference mm -hmm. to me, really. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. We have a vote. Could Any somebody more read the motion? Do you want me to read it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the Planning Board recommends the construction of the Fort Williams multipurpose field with the following recommendations to the Town Council regarding the proposed multipurpose field. Uh, and do you want to hear the, the, mm -hmm. the, okay. One, that the utmost care be taken to provide the maximum buffering of the neighborhood from the playing field and spectator locations. Two, that no electric power or lighting be brought to the site. Three, that the Town Council continue the policy to close the park at dusk. Four, uh, the council consider minimizing intensity of use and noise level by noise levels by restricting hours of play, days of use, and restricting use of the field to Cape teams, Cape Elizabeth teams. Uh, five, that parking for this proposal should be limited to existing parking lots. And I have it as um, motion made by Mr. Atzel and seconded by Mr. Cotter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> all right. Um, all those in favor, please raise the, right, raise the right hand. All those opposed? It's four to two. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment on my negative vote? Is that all right? A quick, that. short statement. Yes. I was in Little League for 10, 12 years, fully supported. Some of the restrictions tonight I feel are difficult to operate a Little League. <clears throat> limiting cars, limiting lights, limiting all that. I hope you can. I want to uh, congratulate you on the presentation, and I hope we get more fields and youngsters get more places to play. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next.
Next item. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda, and we're running considerably behind time, uh, is the Fort Williams rest station. And Maureen, could you give us an introduction on this story in a minute? Yes, I, I can give you a one-minute introduction. Um, Fort Williams rest station is uh, part of a an evaluation that was – uh, prepared by at the direction of the council and reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Uh, the proposal that you have been presented includes uh, a couple of different facilities, including a concession stand. The actual uh, proposal that you've been asked to comment on is a rest station only at a specific location. And again, you're following the same, uh, the same procedure as before, where you are asked to provide comments to the council, and the council will determine whether or not um, they will proceed with this facility. And I believe there's uh, Mr. Howe here to, to present the application to the board. Great. Please proceed. Okay, all set. Thank you. My name is Robert Howe, Terrian Architects. And I know this uh, matter has been before the workshop, before a workshop, so I will be brief. Um, as you know, the commission, at the direction of the town council, was asked to look at the facilities, restroom facilities, at uh, Fort Williams, and to, remake, uh, and to make recommendations to the council regarding the siting and construction of restrooms and the concession facilities. Now. Terran Architects has been working for a while now, and essentially our charge, as we were retained by the Commission, was to quantify the best we could the necessity of a um, and the size of any restroom facilities that might be constructed at the park. Um, so there was a rather lengthy process of um, trying to <coughs> accumulate the data that would support certain size of facilities. Um, taking uh, census of, of people who are using the facility on given dates, uh, uh, some uh, studies that were done in 93, 92, um, reviews with um, state, state park officials on uh, the requirements or typical requirements or demands placed on, on park facilities. They vary from all over the place. Um, again, the, the idea here was to arrive at some uh, logical locations, and also to conduct a uh, feasibility of the construction costs of these various uh, facilities at different sites and see which would be most advantageous. The site that you have seen before and is recommended as 2B is called 2B, and um, uh, they're, in, they're in the uh, yellow manual on how to construct restroom facilities. And um, it seems to be the less, less expensive of the alternatives um, from a construction uh, perspective, although not the first choice by the commission um, in its location or necessarily uh, in that is their, its siting. It does have some advantages, uh, advantages from um, the construction side. Um, with that, I will conclude and uh, ask for your comments or questions. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry if I may address a question to uh, Mr. Howe. I, I, um, there was a hiatus when I wasn't on the planning board, and perhaps this came uh, at least some information at that time. I, what was the impetus behind the commissioning, the commission's recommending that we build a rest faci restroom facility as opposed to continuing the uh, porta potties that are there now? Yeah, I, I don't. Well, I can take a. Uh, uh, I'm not sure the commission really supports the toilet facilities, but Mike, you could probably explain that. I think it was a request from the council 
to examine the possibilities. So. Yes, Cape Elizabeth uh, strives to provide good services to its citizens and to its visitors. Uh, the town has been the subject of a number of very, very nasty letters uh, from citizens, visitors, uh, both to the town office and to the newspaper, deploring the uh, sanitary conditions uh, at Fort Williams Park as they relate to these types of facilities. Uh, therefore, the uh, council uh, set as a number one goal several years ago, we're going to do something about it. Uh, eventually, it worked around that a study was commissioned. Uh, they asked the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, to work with uh, the firm of Terry and Architects, and uh, this is the proposal that came back out of the commission. And then the town council subsequently referred it back to the commission uh, for the review required by Section 19 I believe, uh, as well as to the planning board. Thank you. Mr. Russell? Uh, an issue, I'm sorry, were you all done? That's it. Okay. Um, issue that, that I was looking at, I mean, um, in one of those, again, I was not at the, the, uh, the last workshop, so I missed some of the discussion. Um, it talks about the cost of the proposal as a concern. I, I, um, looking at that, we're, uh, as far as a cost efficiency, I understand we're trying to provide good service, um, but we're looking at $12,000, $12,300 per toilet. Um, in a third of that cost is in a rather expensive septic system. Right. Was there at any time consideration given to the cost of putting this facility in a location on the park uh, close to the activity areas that was within that same cost parameter of twenty-four, dollars $25,000 of hooking that to town sewer. Mm -hmm. I have a real problem as, as one planning board member putting a system limited to 1,500 gallons per day, which is about six bus loads of... Mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, well, there is a recommendation, or a conclusion rather, in here that perhaps if you're looking at more expanded facilities that there are actually two or more remote facilities on site. This one facility seems to be the most cost effective for proximity to power and water and site costs. And obviously, it's more localized to the museum and gathering spaces in that area. But there is a conclusion that if you go beyond a certain threshold for usage, that there, we are obviously ought to continue, not only continue the porta potties mm -hmm. for special events and continue them for but, normal activities, but <coughs> there ought to be other, other, perhaps another plan for another facility that would be somewhere else on the site. But the other two sites are, are both septic. Yes, they underground are. Underground subsurface That's right. system. And what I'm talking about for $25,000 at the same low price uh, proposal, we can be within uh, 250 feet of Shore Road, I would guess. That places you in the area of uh, the tennis courts, the gazebo, um, the lieutenant's quarters, and all of those buildings uh, close to the softball field, mm -hmm. parade grounds, uh, very close to the major activity, the family fun days, but, uh, with no concern in 15, 10, 15 years right. that they will have a uh, fireworks of, of septic system uh, display. I think going. that's a... Good. Uh, um, certainly that was thought about, but I think it was located primarily because of the parking demands and where people park. There is no place along Shore Road, as you know, to park. And there's evidence that what? ledge is very shallow in many places. I, I understand that, and I understand the cost of putting sewer in through mm -hmm. ledge and so forth. And, uh, I, I'm just bringing that up as an issue, um, which I would like to, to forward to uh, or make a recommendation the, that the council consider, um, that, number one, the location where it's proposed, the last thing I want to do, and I, I saw it in there somewhere, is, is to make this a, a pit stop for tour buses. Um, like I said, you know, 50, 50 persons per bus, um, 300 people, five gallons a day, that's a year 1,500, you know, six buses, um, and we're already at maximum. That's not to mention... Um, Combine that with a little league night, and hey ho, uh, we have major league problems or minor league problems. Sorry, um, didn't mean that. I guess I'm just combining those comments with what what I may propose. Comment. If I might, we had an estimate done. I think it was in 1979 to extend sewer up to the offices row area. 
uh, which is where the two brick buildings are left. At that point, it was $140,000. Uh, the reason being is that really the nearest sewer that you can come up from is uh, down at Playstead Field. Uh, it comes down those other streets there, but it doesn't come quite all the way down the street. Mm -hmm. The neighborhood is fed from the back and then uh, back up the streets the opposite way. So it was extremely expensive. And that was the — that's a major factor. Parking is a major factor, as uh, Mr. Howe mentioned. And the third one is the whole issue of visibility. Uh, on, on the one hand, you want it very visible uh, so people know where to find it, so it's physically accessible, uh, and also for a third reason of security. Uh, on the other hand, you also want it in a location that isn't so visible that a blocks an ocean view, sticks out like a sore thumb, and, you know, some of the other areas that were looked at uh, don't uh, rate up very well when you look at those criteria. I guess I, I was on the site this afternoon, and, and, and I wouldn't — even though it is of those estimated, it's most cost-efficient. Uh, um, visually, it's not it, — it's not the — place where we could tuck away that facility in the, in the best way possible. It does stick out as, as you drive up there, the road faces right at that. But you're leaving from yeah. Right. Museum. Coming up there, you're Good. looking right at that rest facility plus the septic field. It's right at where that driveway pulls out of the, the parking lot. So it, I, I guess to a certain extent, um, I lack uh, the understanding of the connection between the importance of locating it close to parking. Um, these are human facilities, not vehicle facilities. Um, I, I have an objection to placing it there simply because it's close to the museum. There are a lot of other activities that, especially when we're only talking about six toilet facilities, um, a lot of activity takes place away from that. If it's a case of the, the picnic facilities, which I think is one of the nicest facilities there with that upper um, level field. Mm. We're still talking of uh, placing it at the other end of that field. I, I know you're shaking your head because you're looking at the $140,000 um, estimate to put in. in, in no, it's in where it's proposed is right below the picnic shelter on that side. Field. I, I know it is, but I mean, what I'm saying is it can be just as convenient on the other side. Um, I'll give up the floor for a while for other comment. Mr. Carter. I know of no public restroom facility that uh, works when it's combined with a septic system. Also, public restroom facilities tend to have peak periods of operation, if you will. Uh, Mr. Edsel has mentioned the motor coach tour, uh, but the park has peak periods of operations when it has larger numbers of people. Weekends are a good example. When that happens, the facility will s receive extended use. And again, uh, in my career path, I've had to shut down properties because of septic systems simply overflowing above ground. I've never seen one yet designed, no matter what the engineers may have told me, or what the local code enforcement officer may have told me that it ended up working. They all eventually overflow above ground. Uh, a public restroom facility that is going to get this type of use simply has to be connected to public sewer or not built at all. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Public sewer, I think, is certainly a requirement. And maybe something could be erected right by the gate with a parking space and maybe 10 or 15 cars where one going in or exiting can make the stop before going into the park. I know if that's going. I know it's not centrally located, but it's certainly it's visible because you're going to be seeing it as you go in. But yet it's not intrusive because it's not really part of the park. It's the very front end of it. And I just would hope that maybe something could be done in that area. Certainly uh, being close within 200 feet to the sewer and 10 or 15 parking spit spots. Uh, would not cost an awful lot of money. And it would take care of those peak periods that Mr. Carter was talking about. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, to echo the comments that have been made. The, the major question that I had when I looked at this was that it just didn't make any sense to try to do it on septic rather than sewer. 
Thank you. Mr. Wilcox. <coughs> uh, I would have a question of the applicant as far as um, maybe perhaps giving us a little background on the on the uh, septic design and whether or not this uh, proposal, um, how it relates or is conceived of under the state plumbing code, which governs uh, approval of septic well, field design. I'd like to, yeah, I'm, I'd like to comment, Mark, on that. But uh, first, uh, I think um, I understand our my uh, role this evening was to, on behalf of the commission, um, make this presentation that you would make recommendations to the town council. Okay, um, so um, I guess in, in, in one way I am an applicant, but in another way it, it is um, uh, we're not seeking site plan approval tonight. So uh, uh, with that, I'll go on to Mark. Mark, we have talked to the Department of Human Services, um, I mean Department of Health Engineering. We have talked to uh, the state plumbing. The state plumbing code is not uh, very good on handling um, this situation. There isn't a good place in, in that uh, manual that deals with uh, restrooms in a park. That's why we went to the state parks, <clears throat> talked to those folks about how, what their experience is across the state, uh, so that, and, and they admit themselves, it's uh, very often a hit or miss issue. Um, it may be successful in some place. They may not anticipate the load. So it, it's, it's something that has to be weighed. These are the best guesses at this moment of what a certain size facility might cost to support certain amount of people attending the uh, park. Okay. I don't think it's, it is anything in here that says that these conditions prevail other than as quantified here. So it's a rather quantified quantitative analysis from that perspective, that we've taken um, a number of resources and the best we could allocate usage per day and come up with an amount of gallons and the number of people that might visit um, and then the cost backing into that, some, some costs related to uh, septic approvals, I mean septic design. No, it, it isn't a science. <coughs> um, just a couple of comments that brought up at the uh, workshop. Uh, we were told that the facility would be closed in the wintertime uh, because of <clears throat> freezing and, and no heating. Um, also, family fun day or something like that, it would be closed and the organizer of that would be responsible for paying for porta potties for those particular. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's right. That's consistent with the unanticipated loads that we could see, the swings you can see on a public facility like this. You know, it, it just strikes me as um, I'm hearing one thing on one end that, uh, gee, it would be great to have it so the tour buses can use it, but the tour buses uh, during a busy time will overflow the system. Um, it would be inconvenient if it's in a location connected to public sewer. It, it seems like a, something that really shouldn't happen. I know we can't, the town can't afford to bring public sewer all the way into um, places with a bus park or what have you to, you know, service the needs of the people that arrive on the buses. But it seems to me it's much more important to uh, service the need of the people that are going to be there all year long as opposed to someone who's going to be there for 20 minutes and spend $7 at the gift shop and then go. But anyway. Okay. I guess I'd just like to say further that the, the north edge of the park is right across from Playstead Park, and I don't know, obviously, where the sewer connection is there, but I guess I would like to see the town uh, get some up-to-date estimates on uh, at least what it would cost to sewer a facility that would be in that corner perhaps closest to Shore Road that is when you come into the entranceway and then come around to the left toward the Goddard Mansion, then there's a, a space that's between the Goddard Mansion and Shore Road there that really has just a path on it and uh, might be a – and actually there's, a, there's an entrance off of Shore Road there that's used by construction vehicles and a walkway and a, a gate in through there. It's, it's really not a particularly uh, 
you know, built-up place right. there now and, and might be a lot more cost-efficient than $140,000 to a sewer facility there. I think you mu it may be more cost-effective a sewer facility, perhaps, but um, as we were looking at the entrance, the entrance is bounded on right and left by large rock outcroppings. There's a substantial amount of ledge there. There's no way to access that easily with vehicles without really making a real visual impact on, on the entrance. And there's no place to park, necessarily. And I think it would, the site development costs for those locations would then tip the scale so that the septic may not be as expensive, but the site development costs may be considerably more expensive. Because the site we're developing now is open, it's unencumbered, the ledge is fairly deep, and uh, so the, the building costs and site development costs are relatively inexpensive, except for the septic system. I, I understand your point and don't pretend to be an expert in this area, but there are one and I think two porta potties that are stationed to the left of the right. parking lot, which mm -hmm. goes to the left, and that would be a site which is out in the open, accessible by a parking lot, and perhaps relatively easy to, to get to. Now, what it would take to get the sewer line to that particular area, I don't know. We're checking to see if the public wanted to comment. <laughs> there is. Okay. One person. <clears throat> Apparently, one from <clears throat> one person from the public would like to comment. Here comes two. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Monahan. I live at Surf Road, and fortunately, I moved here about the time the town bought the park, and they've done an absolutely magnificent job with it. And I hope that people like you can continue it along. However, I see no need whatsoever for restrooms in the park. It seems to me it's something that's just came up through the ground like mushrooms. And the fact that you got an occasional letter saying that uh, it's filthy and it's terrible, did they say anything about the, the fact that it was raining that day and the view was terrible as well? I mean, we can't. I am very, very much opposed to charging admission to the park. I would. Uh, do anything possible because I think in my letter probably have you read my letter? Yes. Well, basically, I think we're just by the luck of the draw. We happen to live in Cape Elizabeth, and this beautiful piece of property came along. <coughs> I don't think that we that we can look people in the face and not sh share it with them. But you know, if we go along and build a hundred thousand um, dollar breast facility that's open only six months a year that isn't going to negate the use of the poor toilets anyway. This lady, these ladies who write about the filthy condition of the poor toilets, if they aren't you know, first in line to get into the, the restroom, they're still going to have to use the poor toilets, and they're still going to complain. So I, and uh, in discussing the, the sewer situation with Mr. Van Fleet when he was here, uh, he said that they didn't even want to consider putting the figure down because it was so embarrassingly high. To, you know, go through the ledge to connect up with an actual sewer thing. I think that, you know, we should put up with the best we can and perhaps be a little bit more diligent in servicing them. You know, once a month I'll send some flowers over and you can put some flowers in. But I certainly don't see there's any reason to spend money for something of this nature because we're still faced with having to use porta toilets anyway. And this was mentioned previously. It was mentioned uh, when Mr. Carter before that they know you have a nice facility, you're going to have more and more buses coming in. And perhaps it will discourage some people from using the fort. I mean, if they have difficulty in, you know, not being able to go from here to there uh, without having a facility, perhaps they won't come because one of the problems we're going to have basically is just an, over, uh, an overwhelming number of people coming out to visit the place. So it is now apparently most of the tour buses do they have, own, have their own facility. Then there's a the problem of, of policing it. Uh, graffiti, uh, abnormal sexual activity in it, and it's just a, uh, a nightmare. So I think we'd be better off to, you know, take the occasional kick in the pants we get for having a, a bad day with the port of toilets and let it go with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Linnell. Bill Linnell, Westfield Road, also on the council. Um, 
I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. You know, one of the reasons uh, we've been looking at this, the issue of toilets at Fort Williams, is because of the porta potties. And I'll tell you, I think the, uh, it's, it's really in, in bad form to, to have this park and, and invite people to come to this park and, uh, and, 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 uh, and if they need to use a, a bathroom, uh, uh, relegate them to porta potties. I think they're disgusting. Uh, and surely, um, you know, uh, when, when, uh, when, when you look at when you look at a site plan for a for a single family home, I mean, I don't think you would say, um, you know, there are problems with sew- with uh, septic systems, and and therefore we we would prefer that you put in a porta potty. I mean, I, I just don't think that's a it's a reasonable option to to continue to ask. Uh, people to use porta potties. Now, you know, we, they were there were several engineering, uh, sev- several options that engineers looked at in terms of how to to, to best put in some sort of a uh, uh, a permanent uh, facility, and uh, it would be nice to run sewer way down there, but it seemed cost prohibitive. Um, so. Uh, I'll just tell you, I think the, the proposal they've come up with is, is the best compromise. It's a dramatic improvement over uh, the porta potty situation, which I think is, is, is it's embarrassing. And, and uh, I think that it's something that we ought to rectify as soon as possible. Um, also, in terms of uh, uh, accommodating handicapped people, for example, I think uh, porta potty is, is kind of a tough. Uh, uh, Tough thing to get into with a wheelchair. I know they do have some some special ones, but um, certainly for overflow, there are times when we can have porta potties out there. But I, I just I just think this is something we ought to uh, we ought to look at, and uh, and 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 uh, I think uh, again, it's just I just think it's embarrassing the way it is now, and we ought to do something about it. Yeah. Excuse me. You like to speak? I guess I'm asking, are you speaking to us as a private citizen or as a counselor? Actually, uh, if I may, as a counselor. Uh, but it's my, it's my personal opinion. I, I just want... If I, that's appropriate. I don't know if it's appropriate. I don't think that it is. I think we're preparing comments to the council, which you have every right to discuss as counselors. Um, I appreciate your comments as, as, a, as a private citizen. Sure. Fine. Um, and, and take them as such, but to use that influence as a, as a counselor, I don't know that that's appropriate uh, at this point. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. McGovern. I'm speaking as the town manager of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I think that's appropriate, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Etzel. Uh, a couple of thoughts come to mind over you know, being in the town oh, 17 years now. And that is that, you know, if anyone came before this board and suggested we were going to have any site with, that gets 600,000 or more people a year and said we were going to simply handle it by porta potties, we'd be laughed out of the room, or the applicant would be laughed out of the room. You know, I think the town is making a good faith effort to address what is essentially a public health issue. Uh, you know, maybe it's not the best solution. It would be nice to be able to do something connected to sewer. It'd be nice to be able to have a couple hundred thousand extra dollars to eventually do that, but everything is not perfect. Uh, it, it's, you know, that's the reality of the, the fiscal affairs of this community, uh, is that, you know, we have to try to address issues. Not all the solutions are ideal, but in the end, we really need to look out for the public health, the public safety, and the public welfare. And I think you really need to ask yourselves as planning board members, is the continuation of the use of portable toilets over the long term really looking out for the public health? And I think that you should look at that issue as well as, uh, you know, some of the concerns you've addressed this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay. Um, any board members have any further comments? Ms. Dressel? I, I guess my only comment is that I think we're handling this in the same 
manner as the, the prior agenda item. And if, if we simply decide to recommend to the, to the council that we not recommend construction of the rest of the facility unless it is hooked to public sewer, that's only our advice to, the, to them as planners, and that's why they come to us. Um, we're not counselors, uh, town council people. We're, we're planners. Um, if that's the best planning advice we can give, do what they may with it, and then, and then let it be that. I think that's the limited role that we play in this case. If they say, to heck with them, we're going to put it, it needs to go back to site plan review, we, we do it as site plan review. Have you just made a motion? Um, I'd like to make a motion, if you yes, would do. allow me to. A motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the planning board recommends to the, that the town council uh, reject the proposed Fort Williams rest station uh, unless it can be connected to town sewer. We hear a second. I'll second. <clears throat> Any further comment, Mr. Wilcox? Um, I'd just like to note for the record that we have many applicants come before this board with septic systems meeting state plumbing code, which this uh, proposal appears to do, and uh, we do not feel that we have the authority to force them to hook up to sewer. Uh, I think it's uh, something where the uh, work that's, in, that's been done uh, does appear uh, to be done with careful engineering, even though the volumes and the size of the facility have been scaled back so that it's a, quote, non-engineered system uh, for approval purposes, and that uh, it appears to be um, to be a facility which, uh, if one was inclined to offer such civic amenities uh, on the part of a, of a municipality, that this uh, would be something that I think could be could be reasonably done. Uh, whether or not uh, programmatically a civic amenity is sponsored by a municipality I think is beyond the uh, reaches of this board. Uh, so I, uh, I don't feel comfortable with, with that uh, motion. Ms. McKay? That helps me clarify my uh, concerns a little bit more, and that is uh, I think the, the reason that I feel that we should not accept a septic system as proposed here is that normally when we are considering, considering proposals, we have a much better handle on what the proposed usage of the system is. And it seems to me that the assumptions in this proposal are, I mean, you know, no, no nothing in the world is perfect and we don't have anything that's, uh, you know, cast in stone, but... Uh, there are so many, there's su such flexibility in the assumptions here, and it seems to me that this is, it would be spending good town money to construct a very slender reed, uh, something that really is a Band-Aid. It won't really hold up in the long run. And if we want to prepare first-class amenities, and I have no difficulty with uh, with doing that, although... I don't feel as strongly as uh, some people do about the fact that porta potties are an embarrassment. I mean, uh, you know, I've used them and I don't have any particular problems with them, although I would certainly prefer to use a rest station, but not at a, uh, you know, not if it's an enormous cost for something that really will not service us in the long run. So I think that's my concern about the, the septic system. And I really would like to urge the town to be a good citizen in the sewer uh, world and to explore uh, the, the, the capability of connecting with sewer. Thank you. Mr. Russell? Yeah, I, I think Mark's comment is good, but it points out the issue that we're giving advice to the, or recommendation to mm -hmm. the town council. If it comes back to us as a site review um, or site plan review, then we have to deal with those issues and certainly I've made motions where I don't think the septic part of the plan has substantially satisfied the ordinance. So it's not a case of, of uh, we have to accept it. But at the same time, in that site plan review, um, yeah, that, that's an issue. I mean, yeah, it, if, if 
the facts are presented, and, and it's quite clear that state plumbing code, da, 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 all of those items are met, and this it substantially meets the, the ordinance, um, then so be it. We have to vote in that manner. All we're doing at this point is, is giving advice to the <coughs> council. We'd rather see, we would recommend that it's a hook to, to, uh, to town to it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the motion won't pass, but then we'll change that. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Carter, I agree with Mr. Wilcox's comments, and uh, chances are if this same exact proposal came back to the board in a month, we'd probably have no choice to, but to approve it. Uh, I just want to reemphasize that uh, if you're talking about a septic system for a residential house here in Cape Elizabeth, and some board members are very uncomfortable with that, but as I just stated there, they normally vote for it anyways because they have no choice. You're talking about a septic system that's handling two to 500 gallons a day, depending on the size of that family. This particular septic system that you're proposing for Cape Elizabeth, depending on what percentage of people you're willing to upset that come to the park and will use a public facility, you're talking three to 5,000 gallons a day. And again, I'd like to emphasize, I've seen facilities this size fail. And if you want to see a half acre to an acre of human waste in the middle of Cape Elizabeth's Fort Williams Park, and you'll have to close the entire park for the day or until such time as the system is repaired because it will be a public nuisance. If you want to see how big these things get, go down to the public restroom facilities uh, in Kittery on the main turnpike. There's a seven and a half acre septic system there. And if you talk to some of the people who work there off the record, they'll tell you it doesn't work. That sewage comes to the surface. And Again, I'm not trying to prevent bathrooms at, Cape, at, at Fort Williams. I, I just want to emphasize the true nature of the problem of disposing of three to 5,000 gallons of waste per day. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wilcox? I could, I could perhaps clarify my earlier comments uh, just for the benefit of other board members. Um, I wouldn't, I don't think I would let this go out of here in, in any case without a firm recommendation that sewer be considered, if at all possible. I think I would probably just personally have proposed it the other way around, but I think it's probably more of a semantic interpretation at this point. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Can Time for a vote. Everyone comfortable with that? All those in favor. Could you read the motion again just so there's no. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the planning board recommends that, uh, that the town, town council reject the proposed Fort Williams rest station unless it can be connected to town sewer. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion as read? All those opposed? Five to one. Thank you. Oh, that's right. <coughs> <coughs> Not you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Oh, I so, was Mr. McClain, or is that the uh, gentleman no. left next door to the uh, assistant flight to Chio? No? Ed McClain. Macklin. Okay. M A C K L I N is the way I wrote it down. 981 Shore Road. In Macaulay. Oh, is it? Uh, given the late hour, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'd like to uh, move on. Uh, we are under new business, and it is after 10 o'clock. However, this is not uh, the rest of the re remaining new business is not a uh, uh, a large project or any issues pending. Um, 
I guess what I would prefer to do at this time is table the uh, planning board rules until the, the next regular meeting of the board, unless the board uh, decides otherwise, and to focus on the sewer amendment and zoning issues, uh, zoning ordinance uh, revision. Uh, Unless we pass these, then we can take this up at, at the time. I, I would move on the planning board rules. I have no comments on them and thought they were fine. I don't know what other people feel, but I'd be happy to, to move that the board, the rules be recommended to the town council for consideration. How does the rest of the board? I'll just poll the board. Yeah. Everyone, like, you know, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Do I hear a motion? I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the submitted drafts and the facts presented, the planning board rules be recommended to the town. The planning board rules as presented in the submitted draft be recommended to the town council for consideration. Second. All those in favor? Any discussion? I'm sorry. <laughs> Being no discussion, all those in favor, raise your right hand. It passes unanimously. Got to hold it up now. Uh, well, last item on this evening's agenda is a sewer amendment to the zoning ordinance. Uh, Maureen, would you just give us a brief background on this, please? Sure. When the, um, when the council looked at making some policy changes to the sewage ordinance, the uh, town attorney suggested that this amendment also be added. Probably should have been done when the council made its, its amendment several months ago that um, moved all the appeals for sewers to the zoning board. Instead, they kind of missed it, and they're looking at it now. It's not really supposed to. It's just supposed to be a clarifying amendment. Are there any questions? Any uh, questions or comments? I have one question. Is it indeed the uh, uh, under uh, the, the revision, it says the board. Hmm. Is it necessary to state the zoning board or the board of zoning appeals? I look back in the text, the same thing, that's the only thing I have on the whole thing. Is in the zoning ordinance, the, when a reference is made to the board, it specifically states that a reference to the board is to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So you can, in the zoning ordinance, say the board, and there is a section in the zoning ordinance that says any reference to the board is the Zoning Board of Appeals. So you don't have to say Zoning Board of Appeals. We can add it if you want. Uh, this is a recommendation to the council, isn't it? Recommend to the, recommendation to the council for an amendment to the zoning ordinance. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to make a motion. Certainly. Proceed. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the submitted draft and the facts presented, the sewer amendment to the zoning ordinance be recommended to the town council for consideration. Second. Any comment? I would... Uh, Actually, for, for approval, if I can amend my own motion. Is that what we're asking? I just say consideration. You can change it to approval. Um, For consideration and approval. Because I guess I, I've always assumed that if you didn't want them to consider it, you would say it's not recommended. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would agree with the motion, uh, but I would recommend to the council. Is that, there a second to the motion? Um, I thought the, I yeah, Mr. the Etz, yeah. uh, Mr. Parkhurst. Uh, I would just request that the council clarify the language by stating specifically that it's either the zoning board or the board of zoning appeals, whatever the appropriate name is, since both boards use a zoning ordinance. Just, to, I mean, the, the planning board at this very moment can just add that language in and then recommend that mm -hmm. if you want. Let's simply add, amend it to add that specific board. I don't have a good ability with that. Okay. Amend it so that it reads the zoning board of appeals shall have exclusive jurisdiction. Okay. Good. And second is amended. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of the motion as it's amended, raise your right hand. Unanimous. Uh, any other items for discussion this evening? Mr. Edson. There's one thing that in the, in, uh, the correspondence, I hope I didn't, in the, in the uh, planning commissioner's journal, page 19, there's a book, I think it's called, what's it called? R R Rural by Design. Rural by Design. Oh, um, yes. I, I think... In this town, it, there'd be, I don't know, if we could just look into the cost of that. It's a 400-page $70. Book. How much? $70. $70. Uh, is it available in any of the libraries? Yeah, the, my or? second recommendation, if, if the town weren't, or the planning department were not to purchase it, make a recommendation to the town library as a recommended purchase. I mean, the council's um, adopted a budget that would uh, provide the, the planning office with, um, I think, Two hundred dollars for budget for books. So, I mean, if you're willing to wait until July one, I'd be happy to purchase it. It, it, it stood out to me as mm -hmm. something that would be might be useful. Mm -hmm. So, would you be willing to allocate that? Mm -hmm. 
or at least order it on approval and see if it's worth it. Well, but let's it looks poll the board now. Is the bowl, board in favor of purchasing the book? Sure. Also in favor, raise your right hand. <laughs> idea. Any other items? I did receive some correspondence uh, from uh, a fellow member, uh, Steve Etzel, regarding uh, the board's previous discussion. You don't mind if I... Uh, regarding the board's previous discussion uh, with respect to the um, parking of vehicles adjacent to existing trees in front of the middle school, and he's noted that the condition appears to be worse than when he first noted it some time ago. Uh, unfortunately, the discussions about that situation broaden into a wider issue that uh, was of concern to uh, both staff and, and the town manager and perhaps other members of the public that were affected by the discussion. What I'd like to do is, is to uh, forward Steve's uh, memo to Maureen and uh, ask her to deal with it administratively with the manager and with the code enforcement officer because I think the points are well, are well taken. What Steve is, is saying in this letter, uh, he notes that since my ill-guided comment at the January meeting, I don't believe that it's at all ill-guided. I just think it was an observation. Uh, voice, voicing uh, my dissatisfaction with the contractor's storage of materials, vehicles, and trailers and staging areas, a recent glance at the site indicates that things have gone from bad to worse. Uh, from my own experience, I can tell you that uh, sites get very busy, things get very congested, and it's Is, very Was that the end of his letter? Uh, I realize that, no, I realize that I missed two workshops over the past four months during which this may have been re responded or discussed. However, if there is any response to your inquiry, please inform me. Thanks. And I think it's appropriate just to refer those comments to the planner and, and ask that they be discussed administratively uh, with the appropriate authority, so to speak. And with that, I'll forward this on to Maureen. Thanks to Mr. Edson for bringing it to our attention. Again, I think it is appropriate if the board sees things that are not consistent with any application to uh, inform uh, Maureen or you know, other board members of the situation and see if there's any agreement on that basis. Uh, with that, any other items for this evening's agenda? Nothing on the agenda. Do I hear a motion? Move, I move the, uh, that we adjourn. Indeed. All those in favor? Meetings adjourned. Thank you.